So you understood from what Irene was telling that today we are covering in this webinar a couple of uh, issues, a couple of topics, but we are indeed preparing with your collaboration a, a, a real textbook on the issue of uh, small renal masses and uh, what is the best way to tackle these. Now, I just want to give a short overview of what uh, we have been living in the last years. You know, sure, the, the elder amongst us that uh, the, many years ago, every solid mass that we saw on imaging was sanctioned by a radical nephrectomy. This was the way we did it. But then there was imperative nephron sparing surgery in cases where patients have a solitary kidney, where there was renal failure, uh, bilateral tumors, then came up elective nephron sparing surgery. Then came up the ablative techniques, term ablative or others. And then finally, there also came the active surveillance, the observation. And about never randomized clinical trials were done to compare any of these treatments. Now, what we as surgeons have in, in our hand is that we can try to avoid chronic kidney disease by trying not to reduce the kidney mass too much by resecting tumors. And this is obviously the way that we can explain that we attempt to do partial nephrectomy and nephron sparing surgery uh, in order to avoid chronic kidney disease. And this is very old literature, you see 2006, where you see that the likelihood of a patient after uh, surgery to end up with an EGFR below 60 on the left side, below 45 on the right side, is obviously much higher when he had a radical nephrectomy as when he had a partial nephrectomy. So we know that we avoid significant renal function loss. And why is this important? It's because it's immediately linked, correlated to the cardiac specific survival. So we need to preserve kidney function, that's for sure, and not do radical nephrectomies when we can do something else. And I already in, in 1991 published in what was still the British Journal of Urology, not BGU International as it is today. I published on my experience with partial nephrectomy with conservative surgery in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma, going against the policy of doing radical nephrectomy for every uh, solid mass, uh, my experience since 1981. And I published on 31 patients. I sent it to the Journal of Urology, where they declined it, uh, and then got uh, first a publication from the Cleveland Clinic. But then I went to the BGU, and I published on 31 patients who had tumors up to 12 centimeters because I strongly believed that nephron sparing surgery would lead to less chronic kidney disease, to less cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality and to better quality of life. But I was a lot criticized about it and not all people were happy that I did not use radical nephrectomy any longer in these cases. So I designed a trial within the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. And this was in 1990, where I did a prospective randomized interface, intergroup phase three study to compare the oncological outcome of elective nephron sparing surgery. This is with a normal contralateral kidney uh, versus radical nephrectomy for low-stage renal cell carcinoma. And low stage at that time in the OTNM classification was T1, T2, tumors up to five centimeters in diameter. And what I wanted to show is that I was right doing this and to show that this approach was equivalent. And what came out is indeed that there was no, when it comes to overall survival, no statistically significant difference but strangely enough, the overall survival seemed the, to be a bit better with radical nephrectomy as compared to nephron sparing surgery, which we did not understand because radical nephrectomy, you have uh, less kidney function, less EGFR, and you should have more overall mortality, which was not the case in this randomized trial. So we went back to the data that we had at that time and looked at 
those radical nephrectomies and partial nephrectomies. And this is what happens astonishingly when we published this in 2013, that when patients have a radical nephrectomy, their kidney function does not gradually go down as we have been thinking in the past. Obviously, the kidney function in partial nephrectomy is better as compared to the radical nephrectomy. But you see that even these patients improve their kidney function in the end. So this is what happens in real life in otherwise healthy renal cell carcinoma patients. And this made for me that I needed to change the policy of saying we should always do a partial nephrectomy. As the EAU guidelines is telling us, we should do a partial nephrectomy whenever possible. But I think that we should have a different policy. Urologists should obviously not resect kidneys if it is safe to do otherwise. And many small renal masses will be amenable for an oncologically and technically safe nephron sparing surgery. And larger and more complex RCCs can be subjected to elective, elective nephron sparing surgery, but this is allowed only when this is oncologically and technically safe. And otherwise, it is useless and it can be dangerous and have more complications. So when you look at the, the 2020 edition of the EAU guidelines, you should offer partial nephrectomy to patients with T1 tumors. I believe that if the patient has a healthy kidney, you should really think about doing an easy, minimal invasive radical nephrectomy than doing a dangerous, toxic, and complication-full uh, partial nephrectomy when the contralateral kidney is normal. Then there is the ablative therapies, and I've never been doing one of these. We had a radiofrequency ablation in my department. I never did cryo for kidney tumors. There is other ways like high few microwave and uh, technologies are different. The most used are cryo and radiofrequency ablation, and the techniques are percutaneous guided with CT, ultrasound, or MRI, or laparoscopically assisted. Now, I think it is, have, has not been clear for years whether you need to do a biopsy, irrespective of the technique and the technology, before the treatment decision is made. But in the guidelines today, I think we recommend to have a biopsy before the procedure and not just during the procedure. We will hear uh, one of our speakers on the biopsy and the importance of it. So as I said, there's RFA, cryoablation, microwave ablation, stereotactive ablative radiotherapy, irreversible electroporation. And one of the uh, important things is that obviously this is looks like being quite complex and complicated. The patient has a laparoscopy, he has a general anesthesia, you need an ultrasound probe inserted to see what you do. While uh, radiofrequency ablation, okay, it can be done under uh, general anesthesia or local regional anesthesia, but it's an easy equipment, it's just a needle, it's a small machine. So there is many factors that need to be taken into account when we evaluate the ablation methods and certainly the result of the ablation. Now, when there is a renal mass smaller than 3.5 centimeters, what well, approach will we choose? And I think this has been depending on a lot of uh, parameters. First, there is the oncologic efficacy. Is cryo better than radiofrequency ablation? <clears throat> there is the risk of complications. There is the availability of the equipment. Uh, as I said, uh, cryo ablation necessitates more complex uh, equipment than radiofrequency ablation. And then there is the most important physician factors. The ease to perform the procedure and for us, we had chosen RFA rather than cryo. The experience, the operative time you have, the reimbursement, and then obviously the tumor characteristics, because we all know that centrally located tumors for thermal ablation are much more difficult to uh, have a definitive cure than, for instance, in these peripherally located tumors. And look at this case, what would you do here? And I think it's a question that depends on many factors. What would you do in, this is a 65 year old retired pharmacist. He's a healthy golf player and he has a normal EGFR 
and a normal contralateral kidney. And I come back to what I said earlier. What I would do in this case is do a radical nephrectomy minimally invasively. The patient goes home the day after the surgery without complications. But if this is the same pharmacist who has kidney, chronic kidney disease, grade two or more, who has cardiovascular disease, who has untreated arterial hypertension, who has diabetes, he should absolutely have conservative treatment. Will this be uh, done with ablation therapy? Probably this will necessitate a complex, more complex nephron sparing surgery because this is an imperative indication. So I remember that Michael Marberger one day when I uh, showed him or talked to him and told that I'm quite skeptic about the ablative procedures, that he said, you cannot pee against the wind unless you wet your trousers. And he's absolutely correct. The ablative therapies are there to stay, but what their place will be is still not determined. So the question that we have posed in this webinar, uh, what is the, the optimal treatment? I think that we cannot give a solution yet. What do the EAU guidelines recommend? And this is the strong and weak evidence is mentioned here. Firstly, you offer a laparoscopic radical nephrectomy to healthy patients with difficult, complex T1 or more than T1 tumors. This is what I have been arguing before. You offer active surveillance or thermal ablation in frail and or comorbid patients with small renal masses. The evidence is weak, however. And cryo and radiofrequency ablation have a lower morbidity but, high, but higher recurrence rate. Then perform a biopsy. Okay, cryo and radio frequency ablation have lower morbidity but higher recurrence rates, and maybe RFA has more recurrences than cryo. You have to perform a biopsy prior to thermal ablation and do not routinely offer thermal ablation to tumors larger than three centimeters and cryo maybe for tumors larger than four centimeters against weak evidence. So I want to stop it here and I want to listen to my uh, following speakers uh, on the different topics that we have chosen. The first speaker that I want to introduce is Paolo Gontero from the University of Torino in Italy that I know since many, many years. He is the chief at Molinette. Uh, he is giving a course for the European School of Urology on small renal masses. He has been active in the RTC where I met him already so many, many years ago, and he's participating in research projects for prostate and bladder cancer as well. Now, Paolo, my personal good friend, good friend of his family, I want to give the floor to you. I stop sharing my screen and I hope that you can successfully uh, just share yours. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, Paolo. Do I don't hear you? Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. You can start again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Popel. It's a great honor for me to be here today. I thank you very much uh, for the for the invitation and uh, and of course. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, and as you pointed out, uh, uh, you have been my my mentor, and uh, I will never forget that. And so I I will try to to give some uh, uh, ideas about how to minimize the surgical complications. Uh, there will be a lecture which is more devoted to, to evidence based medicine in partial nephrectomy. I think my talk. Uh, will not be very much based on uh, evidence uh, as expected when we talk about uh, trick surgical tricks uh, is is difficult to rely on a 
good uh, level of uh, evidence. So complications in partial nephrectomy, they do exist up to 20% if we consider all graded. Uh, major complications, which are defined by clavier three or more, around uh, uh, 8 to 11 percent. Maybe this uh, estimation is uh, too high. Probably there are other series uh, that probably report uh, lower complications. Um, what are the most uh, common? Hemorrhage, that includes the bleeding hematoma, arteriovenous fistula, pseudoaneurysm. These are all sort of uh, complications that can lead to severe anemia to our patient. Um, urinary fistula. This is fairly rare, I would say. And of course, don't forget about uh, renal failure. Uh, that has a lot to do with the way we perform uh, our procedure. We do have a lot of patients, particularly the elderly ones, uh, who may have a pre-existing uh, chronic renal failure. And these are the patients where even by doing a partial nephrectomy, which is what we do in place of radical nephrectomy to reduce this risk, even in this uh, in this kind of procedure, we may worsen the, the renal failure. What are the factors that may influence the, the risk of complication? Of course, it's obvious. They used to talk a lot about the tumor size, but then it came clear that it's not just the size, it's the complexity of the tumor. And then uh, these morphometric uh, um, tools were developed, the padua, the, the, the renal, but also, uh, we all know as a surgeon that uh, we can incur in a, a difficult uh, surgery and potential complication where we have the so-called toxic fat, the peri perirenal fat. And we have to try to predict this possibility. Agent comorbidities, particularly the pre-existing uh, uh, renal failure. And then the surgical approach. But this is a, a, um, an ongoing discussion whether robotic partial nephrectomy helps to reduce uh, the risk of complications. I would, uh, everybody knows that robotic, it's uh, easier to, 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 to handle, to, there as a, a less steep learning, learning curve in general as compared to laparoscopy. However, partial nephrectomy remains a complex procedure, particularly when we want to enlarge our indication, move to more complexity tumors. And finally, the surgeon experience and, of course, the volume of the center. And this is our factors that uh, needs to be taken into account. Well, when we look at the perirenal toxic uh, fat, uh, we have to consider two factors, mainly the thickness of the fat around uh, the tumor and uh, the stranding within the fat. And uh, the Mayo Clinic has developed the so-called Mayo Adhesive Probability Score, which can help, uh, let's say, predict what is going to be the um, complexity of uh, isolating uh, the kidney and the, the, the fat that surrounds the, the tumor. And here is a very simple way that you should keep in mind uh, when uh, you look at CT of the patient, you see on the left-hand side, there is no fat in uh, this patient, whereas uh, in the middle, and particularly in the, in the right, right hand side, you see that the fat is uh, more complex. When uh, you should measure the posterior thickness of, and the lateral thickness of the fat, and when it's more than two centimeters, uh, this will increase the probability of uh, difficulty in isolating the kidney. But also look at the strains, like in the right hand side. Again, this will tell you that uh, you are very likely to incur in the so called uh, toxic fat. What are the risk factors? Being a male, because we know that the, the fat of the woman is uh, is more, let's say, easy to, to, to handle. The age and the comorbidity, particularly the obesity and uh, the presence of metabolic uh, syndrome. And then you, you see here what is uh, seems to be obvious, but uh, please also look at the, when you look at the learning curve, look that if we try to estimate uh, the, let's say, uh, ischemia time, you see that there is a plateau of optimal ischemia time. We know that in a normal kidney, it has to be less than 25 uh, uh, minutes. Uh, you see that around 150 procedure, whereas on the right-hand side, uh, you see that the probability to reduce the complications there is virtually no, not any end in, 
in the learning curve. You see that you can still improve after 300 procedures. And there has been a, a nomogram which has been proposed where you can put together a number of factors, male, uh, trust and comorbidity, uh, the volume of the center and the morphometric score. And you can help to predict what is going to be the risk of obligation. I think that this kind of tool could be helpful for the patient counseling. And then the approach is better robotic, laparoscopic or open. You see here that uh, on, in, in the graph that probably with a robotic surgery, the, the chance of an unsuccessful partial nephrectomy is probably going to be lower with the robotic approach. But again, here is very, very difficult. The, low, the level of evidence is low. Also, is low the level of evidence through which it has been reported that the risk of overall complication is uh, around 8% with robotic uh, as compared to 11% uh, with uh, other uh, technique. But here I just want to show how important it is uh, to try to find, uh, uh, let's say, sorry, now I, I made a mistake. I try again. So how is important and crucial to try to use the right uh, tool? I cannot stop, unfortunately, the, the video. I thought I could do that. Basically, in this case, uh, uh, we were uh, operating um, an angiomyolipoma. And uh, you, could, you could see that the, the angiomyolipoma uh, was uh, actually very near the ureter. And we handle laparoscopically. We do 70% of partial nephrectomy still laparoscopically, only the more difficult with the robotic. And here you can see that uh, by doing this procedure with laparoscopy, we ended up transecting the ureter. So we thought that uh, it was a, a case we could handle with this uh, technique. The following case that I'm going to show you, so you, here you see during the, the, the video, basically you see that the angiomalipoma is predictably bleeding. Here we ended up doing an nephrectomy and we should not have done an nephrectomy. You see another case. This case was an angiomalipoma who had bleeding, uh, bled before and the ureter was just going inside. So we thought this is going to be extremely difficult. And in fact, we used the robotic technique and it ended up being easy. The message is try if you are using different tools, open, robotic, laparoscopic, try to choose what is the best tool for a given case. How do we manage intraoperative complication, bleeding? Medical injury, this case is very, is very rare, of course, but it, it occurs when we isolate the, the pedicle. And keep in mind that uh, you should minimize the isolation of the pedicle. It's not essential to put a tourniquet if you think it's not uh, uh, safe. It's unnecessary, in our opinion, to isolate the vein because you don't need to clamp uh, the, the vein. And uh, here you can see, we have been watching many, many times this uh, complication that we had. Uh, and uh, it was done by one of my colleagues who's a, who's a very, very good uh, good surgeon. He, he, he actually was, uh, was feeling very bad. But honestly, well, of course, you could have minimized the, the isolation of this pedicle. If you incur in this complication, you have to be ready to try to repair. So you, you clip uh, upstream the the vessel, you, you you need to be quick. You cannot place the the the, the kidney too much in 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 ischemia, and that's it. And the, the artery was repaired. But this, the message of this is that probably, in spite, uh, I strongly believe that the, the no ischemia technique is unnecessary. I think is a is a. Um, technique that probably an expert uh, uh, surgeon in partial nephrectomy should learn because sometimes you may incur in a pedicle that you, you are not able to, to isolate. Bleeding during the tumor resection, of course, look for the quality of the clamping that you have done. Sometimes uh, the, the bulldog or whatever you use for, for clamping is not working. You can put a second uh, uh, bulldog. You have to 
to ask to yourself if you have isolated all the arteries. And in this respect, for instance, I think that the 3D reconstruction models uh, where we have little evidence about their, their use probably may help, uh, may help to know better the anatomy and the guide uh, the dissection of the arteries. We have been uh, using this and uh, we perceive, we have no uh, good level of, of evidence, but we perceive that probably uh, they, they are helpful. Anyway, if you have a bleeding that persists uh, during the tumor resection, of course, you increase the pressure. You try to do the parenchymal clamping if, if possible. I personally find this uh, quite, uh, quite uh, tricky. You try to speed up uh, the, the resection and, of course, try to do a selective uh, closure of the vessel. What do you do whether when you have bleeding after the, the clamping? Well, if you have already completed the closure of the, of the, the, the parenchyma, then you can put additional stitches. We use uh, an absorbable two uh, zero vicryl, for instance, in these, uh, in these uh, cases. If the bleeding still persists, well, you may even think just uh, uh, losing the, the stitches, cutting the stitches that you have done before, trying to redo the job. My suggestion, personal suggestion, that if you are unsuccessful, even by after doing that, uh, you should probably refrain to convert to open surgery, thinking that you can handle uh, bleeding in a partial nephrectomy. You just have to accept the fact that you may have to, to do a, a nephrectomy. In, my, uh, in our experience, uh, uh, we tend to prefer the early declamping, because uh, by doing the early declamping, we, we do the resection under ischemia, then we do the early declamping, and by doing so, we think that we are more accurate in the selecting closure of, uh, of the vessels. So, but always keep in mind that uh, to avoid uh, bleeding during a partial nephrectomy, it can uh, virtually be impossible unless you do all the job in total ischemia, but in these cases, probably you uh, prolong too much the ischemia time. We favor um, the, a nuclear resection, meaning that uh, we try to stay as close as possible to the, to the, the, the tumor bed. And by doing so, we think we reduce the, the, the risk of uh, bleeding to open uh, uh, arteries. Also, we, we spare more parenchyma. Of course, we have to be very careful on the tumor margins. We like to use the so-called autologous uh, uh, fat patch, and particularly when we have large filling defects, particularly when we have ileal tumors, because by doing by using this uh, fat patch, we are able to uh, reduce the the traction on uh, on the the stitches and do a good hemostasis. Here we use these tools, but I don't think that uh, we have enough evidence. Here is a ninth. In an ilar tumor, we just did this case last week. You see that we try to stay nearby the, the tumor here, but the, of course the, there is a parenchyma rim because the tumor was totally endofitting. Early, uh, you see now in this case, we did an early declamping. There were two arteries. The sector of the kidney with the colors told us that we could not do a selective ischemia. This is not a major bleeding, but sometimes even by doing the early declamping, there is more bleeding. I think that uh, early declamping allows you to, to better close these vessels. In this case, we use a running shooter, uh, usually a monofilament uh, running uh, uh, suture. Sometimes uh, we use uh, 4 vicryl separate uh, stitches, selective uh, uh, stitches uh, by to, to close uh, the medullary level of, uh, of the parenchyma. We like this uh, monofilament because at the end we try the thread and so we improve our, our hemostasis. And here I show you uh, very briefly that uh, in this case, uh, we prefer to put the fat patch. We don't do it routinely. And as I said, we, we very much like to, to use the fat patch when we have an ileal tumor. How to manage postoperative complication of partial nephrectomy? We have three types. There is a direct bleeding from an artery, which is delayed. It occurs uh, 
uh, can occur uh, more frequently in the first postoperative days. There is the ratrovinus fistula and the pseudoaneurysm, and this can be delayed even by a few uh, weeks. Uh, the drain, keep in mind, uh, in the tumor bed uh, is sometimes misleading. It doesn't simply warn you that uh, the patient is actively bleeding. And in this case, an angio CT, and you need an interventional radiologist to do the selective emboligation. We have almost ever open, reopen a patient that was bleeding in our center. Here you can see the arterovenous uh, fistula, which was uh, uh, successfully um, uh, managed by our interventional radiologist. Here you can see the pseudoaneurysm. Keep in mind that if you do a CT to all postoperative patients, you could find a pseudoaneurysm in up to 20% of cases, but in the majority of these cases, the problem will solve by itself. So the suggestion is that you should treat only the pseudoaneurysms that uh, bleed, that become symptomatic. And this is fairly rare. Luckily, I could not find any predictive factors, any surgical technique that can help you to avoid these complications. Always keep in mind when the patient has hematuria after two, three weeks, that in these cases, this is the complication that is happening. Is, does it help using intraoperative hemostatic to reduce the the, um, the risk of bleeding, there is no evidence. Uh, actually, the evidence is that they are not so uh, useful. So I think I, we personally never use this. We we did in, in, the, in the past few years. Urinary fistula, as I said, is very rare. Uh, should we put a stent when you have a large opening of the, the collective system? No, we never, never put a stent. We have had these complications uh, rarely. We put a double J stent. Uh, if there is, of course, a septic urinoma, you need to drain the, the urinoma as well. If there is a very mild fistula, then you can, of course, try to um, maybe just uh, look for the, uh, the patients and don't even place uh, a stent. Here you, you can see, I just want to, to show this, uh, this case. This was, again, uh, uh, a massive angiomyelopoma. If it was a tumor, confirmed tumor, we would not have done this kind of resection. It was huge, it was a uh, ILR, and eventually it was successful. But just to see that even in this case, we, we largely open uh, the collecting system. You see here is open, but it was also open lower down. And we simply closed, this is important, try to close uh, uh, with the running suture. We use monofilament, uh, the, the collecting system, but we almost ever place a drain. Here you see the selective uh, uh, positioning of a stitches in a bleeder. In this case, uh, there were two arteries. We did a selective clamping, but uh, it was not so selective as you can see. This can, uh, can happen. What about uh, the drain in the surgical bed? As I said, there is no evidence, but we personally always uh, keep the uh, place a drain after a partial nephrectomy. I think is more like feeling reassured. But if you look at the little literature available, there is absolutely no evidence. Toxic fat, of course, try to predict. Look at the CT, and when you have the toxic fat, try to leave a rim of fat. Uh, on the renal parenchyma and on the tumor in order to not to violate uh, the, the tumor. Partial nephrectomy in patients uh, who have cro pre-existing chronic renal failure. Personally, try to use all the tools you have available. Here we were using endotionine to do selective uh, clamping. This was a large tumor in a patient with, uh, with uh, chronic renal failure. It came out being a T3, luckily with the negative margins. Uh, if possible, do uh, no clamping. We, we prefer to do selective clamping or early uh, declamping. Try to spare as much parenchyma as possible and uh, try to optimize uh, the care of the patient with the nephrology. So in conclusion, complication of pasta nephrectomy exists. The more complex the case, of course, the more likely to incur. 
Robotic has not eliminated the risk of complications. Probably they are lower, but they will, they will exist, particularly because we are enlarging the, uh, more and more the indication for partial nephrectomy. Uh, you have to be a careful, you have to do a careful preoperative planning. Uh, look for the tumor, but also look for the patient or his comorbidities, his age, and think about what is the best solution. Sometimes the best solution is simply to do a radical nephrectomy. And of course, adapt the complexity of the case to your personal training. If it's a difficult case, uh, handle to somebody who is more expert. And finally, the most complicated cases should be preferably treated in referral centers, where there is the robotic equipment, but where there is also the interventional radiologist. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Excellent. We will have the discussion later, and I'm pretty sure that there will be a couple of people that want to react on what you have been telling. Uh, I think if you all agree, I would like to go and share my screen again. To introduce Name Stone Group. This is a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce this uh, urological surgeon from Newcastle. Uh, and it's a, a privilege for me because he has been contacting me a couple of months ago because they are doing a new trial on partial nephrectomy, minimal invasive techniques. And uh, uh, he's the director of the robotic and digital surgery. He is doing this trial where I'm now uh, an advisor. I'm very honored, uh, name that I uh, that you have asked me to do so, and I want to see the design of the trial and maybe uh, the difficulties that you have encountered. So please, I will stop sharing my screen and I leave the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Heinz. Uh, Heinz, sorry. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'll try to share my screen and then uh, we'll take from there. Can you uh, see the? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So first of all, uh, can I take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to this um, webinar? Uh, and I'm going to explain uh, uh, to you what we are trying to do in, in, in the UK. And uh, it is great for you to have part of our committee, so advise us how we can best do, especially with your experience and with your uh, historical perspective in terms of uh, minimalism surgery for kid, patient with kidney tumors. So what has been, uh, it has been a three years journey and we have just started recruiting and uh, the trial would run for five years. Um, so uh, what is a partial trial? So it's a pragmatic patient randomized control parallel group superiority trial, which has an internal pilot with an embedded economic evaluation, which is comparing partial effect me uh, and radical effect me for clinical localized renal cell carcinoma. So we're looking at three different things. We're looking at uh, clinical effectiveness, we are looking at cost effectiveness, and we're also looking uh, at uh, system analysis as well. So there are multiple, I'll explain to that what, what we are trying to do, but that is what uh, in, in a paragraph uh, this tr uh, trial is. So why a partial trial was needed? We actually looked at our audit, uh, which was available at that time, British Association of Urological Surgeons like EAU undertakes yearly audits and capture all the data for all cancers. And we're looking at specifically as kidney cancer. So in 2019, uh, over 3000 patients underwent radical nephrectomy for kidney cancer in the UK, and 73% were laparoscopic, 5% were robotic, and 19% were open. We didn't have data available for 3%. Uh, of the partial effect means, over 1,500, 76% were robotic, 9% uh, laparoscopic, and you can see it is split over where there's more laparoscopic in total, whereas more robotic in partial, and 14% were open, 1% not available. So when they look at the staging of the cancer, uh, T1A, four centimeter or less than four centimeter lesion, still in the UK, 35% had radical effect me and 65% patient had 
uh, partial spectrometry. And when we looked at uh, T1B tumor, and, and we actually, our partial trial is more focused on T1B, and I'll explain to you that, that these are tumors between four to seven centimeters. 80% had uh, radical spectrometry, and 20% had partial spectrometry. So we are focusing on complex T1As and T1Bs uh, for this trial. And I'll refer to, to your trial uh, that was the only randomized trial, Hind, uh, which looked at comparison between um, two modalities, but that was a few years back and that was looking at tumors less than five centimeter. Uh, it, and you 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 would be correct to say that it did not uh, cure the numbers. How and and the challenges and we'll talk about the challenges we having the same thing as well. I think their expectation that uh, accrual would be around thirteen hundred uh, to power the study, but th that was not possible. And there was also uh, twenty one percent crossover, uh, mainly from radical effect me, uh, from partial effect me to radical effect me uh, due to technical challenges. And I, uh, and you would agree with me that at that time, uh, the skills of partial effect me was in the transitional phase, uh, laparoscopic uh, partial effect me, which I've done for many, many years myself, was quite challenging. Uh, and um, things have changed. The robotic partial effect me is much more established in the UK and across UK and, and USA now is, is established technique. And we can look at a fresh and see whether we can answer those questions. And that was, we thought the need for that. So what is our inclusion criteria? So it is adults over 18 years, a newly diagnosed uh, clinically localized renal cancer, uh, suspected on cross-sectional imaging or biopsy. And the local and multidisciplinary team meeting in UK, we have in each region, uh, MDTs, uh, which are most multidisciplinary team meetings, actually have and acupoise, or they find that this lesion would be suitable for one or the other. Uh, and we are very focusing on middle invasive. In this trial, we, we are not accepting patients who either had open radical effect me or open partial effect me. And that is about 5% in other groups. So we are saying we would not, we'll only accept minimally invasive, either laparoscopic or a robotic partial effect me. So in this trial, we have uh, tumors which are stage T1, uh, cross-sectional imaging, so up to seven centimeters, where there is acupoise in the MDT and willingness to recruit for the trial. Uh, on imaging, the evidence of normal contralateral kidneys, a uh, patient has been fully counseled, uh, and all the available treatment options, including non-surgical, have been explained to them. Uh, and they are able and willing to give informed consent. They have got uh, capac mental capacity to make those decisions. So what is the exclusion criteria with, with this trial? Solitary functioning kidney, metastatic disease. So we have looked at very closely on CKD and uh, our criteria, somebody who has got an EGFR of less than 45 would not be included in this trial because if they have total infect me, then chances are they will go on to CKD4 possibly. If they are medically unfit for surgery, they have uh, congenital renal abnormalities, which may be very complex, uh, suspected or confirmed inherited kidney cancer syndromes, which will make them at risk, uh, current pregnancy, breastfeeding, and people without capacity. So these are the exclusion criteria. So what are the primary outcomes we are uh, looking at? We are looking at gains versus harm. Uh, Heinz, you referred to that as well. We are looking at uh, preserving renal function over two years initially for the trial. Uh, and then um, and we are going to capture the GFR after one week, then after one month uh, post-intervention, and then 6, 12, and 24 months. We do appreciate that we would not be able to capture the whole breadth of eGFR benefits or deterioration. So we need another study after that to capture data over five, 10 years period. But within the study, which runs for five years, we only have two years of surveillance available to us. That's the gain, i.e. doing partial effect me or total effect me uh, has got beneficial effect on EGFR over a long-term period. Versus harms captured by comprehensive, we are using a new uh, tool, which is called Comprehensive Complication Index, which is based on uh, Clavian and Dindo, but it can go from 1 to 100. And it is over perioperative period, 
three months post intervention in both modalities. So, what is the benefit of gains versus harm? And we also look at the loss of secondary outcome measured ERTC, QLC30, SF36. We look at qualities, cost effectiveness, uh, quality of recovery, QR15. We look at positive surgical margins, need for treatment, recurrence of pre and overall survival, cardiovascular event, progression of chronic disease, operative conversion to radical me, and patient acceptability. We are also looking at why patients choose not to have uh, go into the trial. So we are doing what we call process evaluation as well. Um, so how are we uh, undertaking randomization? So patients are randomly allocated one-to-one -one or either radical affect me or partial affect me. Uh, it is minimized by major confounders of centers. So we have, we have a minimizing strategy that is center preoperative pre DFR between 45 to 59 or over 60, tumor size T1 to TB and pre-randomization biopsy if that was being undertaken in certain centers. Uh, blinding obviously is not possible. Uh, but, but our primary objective is determination uh, of kidney function. So where we, so what we aim to do is, and our power study is powered uh, to recruit uh, 420 patients uh, with an inflated attrition of about 15%, and it is 90% powered on renal function in CCI as primary endpoints. And uh, we wish to recruit approximately one participant per site uh, to reach the targets. And our aim is to have 30 centers recruiting over 20 years. So what is the overview uh, uh, study design? Uh, so basically it's all potentially eligible patients. They are given uh, consent, uh, baseline assessment, and they are randomized to one or the other 210 uh, patients. And they will have these assessments of GFR, uh, uh, after one week, one month post intervention, then three months, six, 12 months, 18 months, and 12 months, uh, sorry, 24 months after that. So, what is the basis of uh, statistical and economic analysis that we are undertaking? Uh, so, all analysis based on in intention to treat principle, uh, one analysis of effectiveness outcome at the end of trial, and safety data monitoring throughout. And our hypothesis is that partial fact me for intermediate size tumors that four to seven centimeters T1B and small tumors T1A, which are endophytic, deeply seated or tumor, which are actually at the higher margin, otherwise complex, uh, result in better kidney function, at least differential we are looking at 10 mils per minute per 1.72 meters square compared to radical fact me in patient who have got normal control at all. Kidney. Uh, pre planned subgroup analysis includes preoperative EGFI, any comorbidity, smoking status, age, size of tumor. And we also look at economic analysis, outcome measures, cost benefit, cost effectiveness. So, what is uh, uh, process evaluation? Purpose to understand how information about participating partial trial and what the reason for patient not to. Uh, undertake in a trial. And surgical trial recruitment, as you would know, uh, uh, is extremely difficult. And we are want to identify barriers to recruitment and understand patient preference. And in order to do that, we will undertake screening, screening logs. We are undertaking audio recording for consultations and interviews with staff and patient. And the outcome would be uh, to improve training and support provided to recruiters to help patients make more informed choices not only for this trial, but also for the future trials as well. So what is the setting? As I said, there are 30 NHS secondary care centers. There are about 120 centers which undertake kidney surgery in the UK. There are at least about 40 which undertake partial effect me, robotic partial effect me, and they are tertiary centers. So for each center, there are about two or three centers feeding into that center. And we have also, uh, want to quality issue. And we were very, very keen that many robotic trials or technology trials came in. The quality assurance of the surgeons and the centers were probably not undertaken well. And we were very, very conscious of that based on previous uh, experience. So for the partial trial to be uh, agreeable for a surgeon to actually be eligible, the surgeon must have done minimal surgical experience for a robotic partial fact me and MIS for radical fact me or be supervised by surgeon that meets that criteria. And the minimum criteria is that person should have done robot, 30 robotic partial infectomies 
and had been doing at least 10 robotic partial drug missions each year in the two previous years. And for laparoscopic or minimalistic radical effect, the surgeon must have done 50 minimalistic radical effect. So I think we were very conscious of that, that we must actually have that criteria and we are strictly applying that. Um, sorry, let me, okay. So where are these centers so far? Uh, we have approached 42 centers. There are about 35 centers which have actually in the UK have agreed to participate. And we have selected 27 sites in England, in Scotland and Wales across the UK. Uh, 10 sites are open for recruitment and 17 sites are in a setup phase. Uh, and, and UK, uh, you, uh, those of you are, who work in the UK experience, it's a very laborious process of taking uh, research and development uh, in each trust to agree that, and it takes three to six months. So we are working through that. So what we have done so far is the first site was open in March, 2023. First patient was recruited uh, in April, and our, our recruitment ends on 31st of December, 2024. And last patient uh, site visit would be December, 2026. And end of study would be uh, June, uh, 2027. So the funding acknowledgement, I must mention that we have got generous funding from uh, National Institute of Research, uh, HTA program, which is funding this property, this study. Uh, and also this study is being run from uh, the Aberdeen Clinical Trials Unit. Uh, Newcastle is the lead side of the trial unit, the Aberdeen Trial Unit, who are doing a fantastic job. Um, and I'll stop uh, over there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is a real, uh, really important uh, trial that you are running and you need to be congratulated for it. The fact is that indeed in the ERTC study that I did, in the end with the re, uh, examination of EGFR and the consequences on kidney function, we showed that maybe radical is not so bad. So I think that this is really giving us an answer. And we will certainly uh, have more questions during the discussion later on. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Samuel. And Thank then you. we go to we go to, again to Brussels to uh, I say Belgium rather, and I see Dr. Rui Farin sitting there in front of the Orsi. Uh, Orsi was actually initially an onze lieve vrouw, robotic surgical. Institute, it has now become a brand name on itself. He's a clinical researcher in the uh, hospital in Aalst, where Alex Motri, that most of you know, is working. He's uh, actually from the University of Leuven, where I work. I didn't have the chance to meet with him personally, and it's really because he came up with the proposal talking about training models for partial nephrectomy that I got very much uh, interested. So, Rui, I look forward on uh, what you've been working on and also okay. to meeting uh, physically with you in the next future. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, so let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, sorry. I need to find my presentation here, which I cannot find. So I'm just trying to see what is my presentation. There seems to be a problem, Rui. Yes, I cannot find a way to share my presentation. I don't know why. Irene, can you allow him to share? Mm -mm. Okay, maybe not. 
I have my presentation here ready to be to be shared, but then I cannot do it. Maybe have, have you sent your slides to uh, Irene? Uh, no. Is it too heavy, probably, to be sent? Uh, yeah, one gigabyte, probably. I think almost. But uh, yeah. what I could ask you is to send it by WeTransfer to Irene. Yeah. And then we go on with the next speaker. We are not running out of time, so don't be nervous. We are nine minutes ahead so far. Irene. Can he send you his presentation by WeTransfer so that you can proceed with showing his slides? Uh, yeah, sure. You can send me your slides and I, I share my screen. Okay, so I'll do it. Okay. Juan, are you there? because he was driving to the hospital. So he will probably connect a little bit later. But maybe that's good for Sudi Raval. I can maybe give you the floor now. Just saying uh, you are from the Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute in New Delhi in India. Uh, you have been one of the pioneers for urological surgery for cancer in your country, but also in China, as I realize. No, no, no not from China, sir. That's, okay. I'm from India, yeah. North, North India. Yeah. Uh, uh, you performed the first retropubic radical prostatectomy in the private sector in India. So you are really a pioneer, and I want to hear you now on the role of the biopsy in the treatment of small renal masses. And this certainly is important when it comes to ablative therapies thermal ablation. So I look very much forward to hear you. I see your screen already. So please, uh, Sudhir, you go ahead. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. It's a really privilege to be part of this faculty. I, I am really inspired by you in past when I saw your AUA paper, paper in high-risk prostate cancer with having high PSA and uh, many, a lot of learning actually had gone through you to me when uh, I evolved in this branch in North India. Uh, today's topic is role of renal bias biopsy in the treatment of a small renal masses. And we'll be talking about why the biopsy is required. And there will be some history why it was given up and then it has come back. And then we'll talk about present uh, scene and the limitation and how it has changed the uh, treatment uh, in the uh, uh, context of renal, small renal masses. And then we'll be talking about future also. Uh, with that, uh, so what is the current incidence of RCC? You know, it is increasing uh, since 2001 to 2016. If you see, it has gone from 9.2 per 1 lakh to 12.5 per 100,000 person. And maximum increase is in, is in T1A, that is in the small renal masses. And how we define them, it is incidentally detected solid cystic cortical masses less than 4, cent, 4 centimeter. And why this has happened is because of the widespread use of cross-sectional imaging. It has happened in my practice also. In 1996, when we started uh, uh, this institute, I've been there since the time of inception. That time I used to have a lot of... Uh, uh, cases with the big kidney cancer and we'll do open surgery but now we get a lot of patients who have a small uh, renal masses and they are detected uh, incidentally and then epidemic of smoking is there hypertension is there and obesity which are risk factor for rcc uh, what has happened the uh, uh, with time that there is a, a rise of all cause mortality and cancer specific mortality in RCC. And that actually we will discuss that how this phenomena is, is because of the treatment disconnect phenomena. But that is why, and I'll discuss in next few slides, why this has happened that we are detecting it early, but still we are 
having the high mortality with all cause and the cancer specific also. So this phenomena, I'll just go uh, one by one in the next few slides that you can see that if preoperative misclassified and surgically removed benign renal masses, this is a systemic review of surgical series, series from United States population level burden estimate. And they showed if the renal mass is less than one centimeter, then the benign tumor work 44%. Percent. One to two centimeter, it was 20.9, and the same is the less than three centimeter. So, this actually uh, shows that if we are treating or removing these tumor, then we are removing a lot of the benign tumor unnecessarily, and that actually will be the uh, treatment, uh, it will come in the data as a treatment for these uh, uh, tumors. So, number of surgically resected benign renal masses has increased from 3098 to 5624 from 2000 to 2009 in this paper. You can the 82% increase in the benign renal masses, which probably they never required if you use the biopsy. This was actually all done when the imaging is being used. Now, histopathological characteristic for localized tumor, you can see that with the size, the low grade, less than 4 centimeters, the low grade tumor may be up to the 84%, but if the size increases, the low-grade tumor becomes less and less. This is the treatment disconnect phenomena where you excise the renal masses and then causes because of the limitation of current imaging and modality to differentiate between the benign versus malignant. And commented there is that 20 to 30 percent of the small renal masses are benign. The treatment of indolent renal cancer amongst the SRM uh, renal masses then the limitation of current imaging again and is cannot predict the biological behavior and majority of small renal masses are low grade with no metastatic potential. And there is a morbidity and mortality due to the active treatment like partial nephrectomy, ablation or radical nephrectomy. These patients will have loss of functional nephron. NF has been said by Dr. Popel and uh, Dr. Uh, from Italy, from Paolo's. And there is a CKD and cardiovascular mortality, morbidity. So there is over diagnosis and over treatment if you are using only imaging for these patients. And a small but significant of SRM will be having metastatic potential also. That's the problem. If you if, if you just leave them, then there will be a florid metastasis also, which can be lethal. So current imaging cannot differentiate between these subset of the patients. This has been shown in this paper also that if you implant uh, the, the renal masses with more than 4 cm, the engraftment rate will be around 18%. If it is less than 4 cm in mice, the engraftment rate will be 3.5% only. But if these masses, despite of uh, irrespective of the size, they have metastasis already in the in the body, then the engraftment rate is, is same, 75 and 71%. So, so it is it is always better to you know what are you dealing with if you do the biopsy the treatment choices has been discussed very well active surveillance hold, partial hold on a second uh, sudhir because the recording has stopped okay sure sir, Just, sure. Okay. okay you can restart sorry okay sure sure sir no, no problem so i was just i was on this slide there's the predicting oncological outcome in small renal masses it's been seen in if you in, in graft a uh, a, a tissue from primary in patients who have localized disease of more than 4 cm, less than 4 cm, the engraftment rate in patients who have more than 4 cm is 18%, while less than 4 cm is 3%, showing that it's a, it's a low grade tumor. But if this same size tumor, more than 4 or less than 4 cm, they have metastasis, then the engraftment rate is, is almost the same. So you can see that, that these are really malignant. The tumor, if, if you know them pre-hand, then the treatment will be different. And the treatment choices, as we know, already has been discussed, is active surveillance, partial nephrectomy, thermal aberration, and, and radical nephrectomy. So how to personalize the care is doing the percutaneous renal biopsy for a small, small renal masses. If you see history, and I remember I'm, I'm, I did finish my... 
I, um, I did my medical schooling in urology in 92 to 95, and we used to have a lot of call from nephrology department when they had the biopsy done for kidney for, for medical renal disease. And we'll get a call that the patient goes, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> okay, so we used to have call from nephrology department when the biopsy will be done for the nephrology. For the uh, medical renal disease, the patient has got hematuria after biopsy. And these are the, historically, we know there was a poor efficacy also. Pathologists were also not giving, the yield was not good with, with the pathologists, poor accuracy, poor reliability, poor safety, and inability to impact the decision making. So this was not very useful in past, but the, with advancement, we know that radiological imaging has improved. There's a biopsy techniques have got uh, now become standardized. There's a pathological reporting has increased tremendously. And then we have IHC staining and we can see that, that we get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the, we get almost answer in all the cases. We just uh, not cannot say that we did not get uh, 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 information when we did the biopsy in these patients. And this is the you can see the diagnostic accuracy accuracy for malignancy in a small renal myopsy reported by Marconi et al. in seven studies showed the sensitivity is 99% or specificity is almost 98%. So whenever you do the biopsy nowadays, you do get the answer. And this can also differentiate between the subtypes also with FNAB, clear cell, papillary or chromophobe, up to the 96% in the same study, the concordance after the, after, after the surgical specimen was removed, when the biopsy was done before uh, surgery, then the, it was 96%. Even five years studies they, they um, uh, analyzed, allowed this analysis to the agreement between tumor histotypes on biopsy and surgical specimen both. So you can say that it's, it's a very useful uh, information. You will get the biopsy. Uh, in any case. Uh, what about grading? That's a problem. It's a still a problem. It's a tendon Achilles heel. You can see that if you have the grading, if you if you categorize uh, the FNAB, the small renal biopsy report according to the grade 1, 2, 3, 4, then overall yield is overall report is 62.5% correct. And in overall RCC and in small renal biopsy, a small renal masses, it is 66.7% on the accurate. But if you say that we make two tier of grading system, like 1 plus 2 is 1 and 3 plus 2 is another group, then you have 87% 80, of the accuracy. Versus, and in a small renal masses, 86% of the uh, 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 accuracy you will get. The issue is because it's all because of the intratumoral heterogeneity and sampling nature of the renal mass biopsy. And there is a inter-observer variability also. This is true in with, even with the nephrectic specimen. If you give it to the uh, pathologist, different pathologists, they will give the different report. This is probably will be taken care by AI in future. Now, this is the, uh, uh, you can see paper in, uh, published in Journal of Urology in 2015, which shows that if you have the clear cell RCC, more than two centimeter high grade, they will be having a low grade tumor also. Here, if you do the small linear biopsy, you may have the low grade report, but they have the high grade tumor also. So in this and same as if the low grade tumor, they do have high grade tumor, but it's a grade two and grade two. So if in these cases, one has to be careful when you are offering the <clears throat> treatment that if you get the report of low grade uh, if you get the if you get the report of low grade tumor low grade tissue that means that doesn't mean that there will not be high grade tumor also that is why the small uh, the renal mass biopsy is has low predictive value for the low grade disease because the the patient may be having high grade disease so one has to be careful when you when you interpret the grade in, in the small renal biopsy now another problem with non uh, our renal biopsy is the non diagnostic and it can be actually uh, nomenclature is important and the report is uh, reported incidence is 0 to 20.6 percent in non-diagnostic it can be non-conclusive non-diagnostic can be because of the insufficient tissue 
there can be fibrosis, necrosis, inflammation, normal renal parenchyma, and there can be extra renal tissue. But the non-conclusive is, despite the adequate representative tissue, pathologist is not is unable to reach a diagnosis. And the cause for non-diagnostic non uh, 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 biopsy is technical failure, while in the non-conclusive is real diagnostic limitation of renal mass biopsy. Uh, non-diagnostic can be reduced by the biopsy technique, sensitization, and a skill of the person who is doing and advancement in imaging, and the non-conclusive report can probably be uh, improved by the pathologist experience and use of the spatial staining and immunohistochemistry. There are some predict factors predicting non-diagnostic biopsy is like cystic versus solid tumor, tumor size, a small tumor yield will be less. In a small tumor, sometimes it actually moves with the needle, so it is better to puncture the tumor and then take the biopsy. Radiological enhancement, if it is low, then the yield will be, will be low. A skin to tumor distance also can be a problem. If it is long distance, more than 13 centimeters, in one paper they have shown that uh, it can be uh, non-diagnostic, endophytic, exophytic, polarity of tumor, upper pole or lower pole, and the position of tumor and the experience of doctor in position of tumor, anterior or posterior. And uh, if you see that in multivariate analysis, they have shown that the mainly the two factors, the size of the tumor and the tumor type solid and cystic are the one which actually uh, can uh, are more most important factors in the non-diagnostic uh, um, uh, biopsy. Uh, one can do the second biopsy, one can take two core, two core is there, but one can do the second biopsy, initial and overall you can do the 94% diagnostic rate. So one can actually reduce the non-diagnostic rate by doing the second biopsy. Is renal biopsy, mass biopsy shape? Yes, definitely. You can see the complication is, is on almost zero in different series to two, one, two, one, two. And the number of seedling is zero. This is myth now that the, the seedling will occur, especially when you use the coaxial needle. And this is another paper which says that all grade one except the one patient required the angioemolization in 509 patients. So one can say that renal, tumor, renal mass biopsy is, is very safe. This is a single center, 13 years experience, which they have published in 2015. Only one patient had required the angio embolization. Now it has the practice changing role. Renal biopsy, I see, it definitely has the practice changing role. After the, doing the renal, bi renal mass biopsy, three times higher rates of active surveillance occurred in pre-biopsy protocol, 13 versus 34. Eight-fold lesser incidence of benign tumors on surgical pathology. You can see in this paper, they have shown how this has affected the practice in, in the small renal masses. Now, this was already uh, emphasized by Dr. Von Pippel that uh, before ablation or at ablation, when we should do, there is recommendation is always before ablation. If you do the before ablation, you will be avoiding 80% of the benign masses doing the ablation. But if you do a, at ablation, that the all night non-diagnostic and benign masses, 30%, 32% will, uh, will go under the ablation. So it is always better to do before ablation rather than at ablation in many centers, when it, uh, many times uh, radiation, the uh, uh, interventional radiologists would like to do the biopsy just before the ablation, which is not a correct practice in, because in that cases, you will be ablating the benign tumor. So how the inter international consensus panel is for a small renal biopsy, how, what, and when. For this, they recommend that core biopsy should be done uh, rather than FNAC. You can take in addition FNAC also, but then core biopsy should be done. They cannot replace F FNAC cannot replace the core biopsy. Needle sizes can be 17 or 18 gauge or larger. Number of cores at at least two cores are must. Then pattern of sampling, peripheral and central. And then image guidance based on availability and expertise. CT guided or ultrasound, it depends on the expertise. They are almost same. And the sample adequacy, one can do the visual inspection and can see how the sample is. 
but then uh, with despite uh, you can reduce the non diagnostic rate by visual inspection as i said already this has been published in 2004 but there is another technique where you can do the rapid onset site evaluation where you take the sample on slide and rub it and see that that the there you can see the white color cells are not there or not they can uh, by by your naked eyes you can know that that the sample is adequate and there is another technique where you can do the stimulated raman histology where you put a special staining and see the under the microscope it is rapid it is high resolution images it does not affect the tissue quality and for subsequent staining you can do on after this does not need on site pathological process and can easily be differentiate between normal tissue versus tumor tissue the future of renal myobiopsy is integrating the biomarkers to aid the decision in making and for this we actually can do all dna rna protein extraction and vhl mutation on renal biopsy alone you need not to have the tumor whole tumor for these doing these studies and there is a uh, you know there is a study tracerex uh, which have uh, concluded that the majority of SR, SRM have low intratumor heterogeneity and have low weighted genomic instability. Very few will have high, unit, high intratumor heterogeneity and high genome instability index, which actually do have metastasize. And that is why the evolutionary classification of SRM may help in choosing the surveillance or active treatment if you, if you incorporate these things and two side biopsy are able to recover nearly all subclonal drivers events in the small renal masses uh, with that coming back to this study which is actually n gamfent rates uh, which showed and in this they actually analyze the bap one loss uh, this is the uh, can be done in any center now we do have this facility where you can say if the bap one loss is associated then the aggressiveness of the tumor is there it can be done easily on, on the biopsy and concordance with BEP1 staining between core biopsy versus surgical pathology specimen was 94.8% and this was better than most adverse pathological features such as great necrosis, hercomotoid and rhabdoid. And if you can do BEP1 on biopsy, and then you can, you know, you, do, you probably do not need to know the grade even. Incorporation of biopsy can be done easily and it is available, including in our center. We do have micro RNA panel also, which can be incorporated with that. That is LET LET seven family micro RNA. And this actually can be used in differentiating the papillary renal cell carcinoma, where they can you can know that if it is let uh, seven family is there, then the patient will not do well. Uh, in the especially in papillary uh, RCC. So my take home message will be that renal, biopsy, renal mass biopsy is safe, accurate, reliable to differentiate benign from malignant masses with high accuracy for RCC subtyping. Its performance for RCC grading is suboptimal, but with evolution, with uh, you know, uh, genetic uh, texting, BEV1 let, uh, probably we in future may not be depending on grading system more on on the deciding the treatment the provision of adequate representative sample cannot be overemphasized you have to take from the you know your uh, uh, interventional radiologist has to take the correct sample it has the potential to change the clinical decision and it will aid in aids in the choosing therapy so you can avoid a lot of uh, unnecessary treatment and you can treat the patient who actually really required Measures to reduce non-diagnosis rates are there and they should be utilized and integration of biomarkers, genomics into the current pathway has immense potential in future. So with that, I again thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, happy to uh, have any comment or question later on. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sudhir. This is a wonderful contribution and an overview that we will badly need for uh, the journal. Uh, to be integrated in the publications to be prepared. I think it was an excellent, excellent overview of all the uh, possibilities, uh, lackings, and future perspectives. So I hope that you will contribute there uh, sure, soon. Sure, and uh, we're going to try Rui Farina again. Uh, I think that he's going to try to share himself first. Otherwise, 
we have a backup with uh, Irene available, but uh, just try to share your screen, Irene. Now I think I can, yes. Much better. Uh, yes, now it's working. Just go ahead. Not. Can you see the presentation or not? Yeah, I see it. We just yes. put it on large screen. Training models for partial nephrectomy. Yes. This is the wonderful uh, statue that we have in front of the Orsi building. Yes. Uh, the man who is measuring the clouds. That's right, Farina? Yes, yeah. that's correct. That's correct. That's correct. So okay, you, um, can, you can enlarge the screen by pushing the bottom on the bottom right so that we see it larger. Yeah. Let me try again because, yeah, no. Can Wonderful. Better? That's great. Yeah. It's good. Okay. Let's go. So, good afternoon to all of you. Um, as you can see, I'm working in RC Academy. I'm uh, also working in uh, Hospital de Luz in Lisbon as a consultant urologist. And um, since 2019, I'm involved in robotic surgical training, in the development of surgical metrics and uh, surgical training models. Um, first of all, I want to express my gratitude to Professor Hendrik van Poppel for inviting me to give uh, a talk in this webinar about the current management of small renal masses. It is indeed an honor to share my insight and my expertise with the audience, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity. And this webinar has a challenging question. Is there an optimal choice for the management of small renal masses? And uh, one way uh, to answer is to discuss the importance of uh, training models in partial nephrectomy. It's Common knowledge that the robot assisted partial nephrectomy is a common is a complex procedure, and it's also an index procedure that urologists need to learn how to perform safely. It has a difficult learning curve, it requires a step-by-step -step training process, it has several critical steps, it requires the need to obtain negative surgical margins, and there is the utmost need to control bleeding in order to avoid a potentially life-threatening hemorrhage. This complexity underscores the need for a structured training program that should start in the laboratory with the, with the use of procedure-specific simulation training models. In the particular case of small renal masses, various treatment options are available, including active surveillance, ablation, and different types of surgery, including robot assisted partial nephrectomy. This raises the question of whether there is an optimal choice for the management of small renal masses. And this depends not only on the specific characteristics of the renal mass and the patient's overall health status, but also on the surgeon's skills and expertise in the chosen procedure. This directly ties to the importance of training models for robot-assisted partial nephrectomy. Effective training models can help surgeons hone their skills and improve patient outcomes in robot-assisted partial nephrectomy, potentially making this technique a more viable and preferred option in the management of small renal masses. They allow surgeons to practice and perfect their techniques in a risk-free environment, reducing potential complications and improving the efficiency and success rate of the surgery. Consequently, the development and improvement of these training models can contribute significantly to establish a happen as an optimal choice in the management of small renal masses. Now, the question is how to develop a good training model. Tracing back to the 16th century and the origins of modern human anatomy, Vesalius used cadaveric dissection to test the published anatomical information of those days against the facts. From that time, we've seen several simulation training models being developed for different medical and surgical fields. Fast forward to recent times, the work of Richard Satava as the program manager of advanced biomedical technology at DARPA has led to significant advancements in the field 
of virtual reality surgical simulation for surgical tasks to train surgeons, introducing the most advanced technology into the surgical simulation field. Following a thorough review, I discovered that leveraging the advancements pioneered by figures like Satava and others led to the emergence of numerous innovative partial nephrectomy training models. These models ranged from those based on animal tissues, on 3D printing, to those utilizing cutting edge virtual reality and augmented reality technologies. And from this literature review, uh, I took the following lessons. In relation to the training models, use ex vivo porcine kidneys because these kidneys are widely available. They closely emulate human tissues, allowing trainees to experience realistic anatomical structures, tissue consistency, and movement during surgical procedures, enhancing the trainee's understanding of partial nephrectomy intricate surgical technique. Using a commercially available injectable product emulate a tumor, a pseudo tumor of around two centimeters in an accessible and constant part of the kidney. And also emulate as many phases and steps of the happen procedure as possible, although pseudo tumor excision and henography are obviously mandatory. Since we will be using ex vivo porcine kidneys, this will decrease the cost of the model and spare a huge amount of porcine deaths solely for the purpose of training a happen surgery, not forgetting all the savings on the need of purchasing and housing animals, veterinary care, use of anesthesia and medications, the need to comply with regulations, staff training and oversight, waste disposal and replacement of animals. In respect to study methodology, we should consistently use the same material and technique to emulate the pseudotumors to allow comparisons between different study populations in different training centers. At a certain point, a cost-effectiveness study will have to be done to show the economic viability of the training model, especially when comparisons with other high-tech simulators are mandatory. Also, studies on the transferability of skills from the happen training model to the human patient will have to be done. Procedure specific level criteria, skill level criteria would have to be defined to differentiate novices from experts. Face and content validity questionnaires would be employed immediately after experts used the training model. For construct validity studies, expert assessors would be trained on the use of the model, specific hub metrics, up to a consistently achieved interrater reliability above 0.8. And only then they would start the blinded assessment of happen training model videos done by novices and experts. In terms of metrics, time would not be our primary metric due to its weak correlation with the quality of performance. We would never use Likert type assessment scales like gears or goals since they are highly subjective, inconsistent, unreliable and unsuitable to assess surgical performance. We would give primacy to the use of binary training model specific happen metrics derived from the human happen metrics. So at RC Academy, I found myself surrounded by loads of helpful materials, making it the perfect place to create a new happen training model. And this place was full of enthusiastic beginner happen surgeons ready to start their surgical training. They started with focusing on small handle masses, preparing themselves to later handle more complex cases. And during their training, it became clear that acquiring fundamental skills of happen surgery was absolutely necessary. So the idea of improving the way trainees acquire their skills in the lab became an exciting mission. When the trainees arrive at the RC training center, they use robotic training platforms to operate in dry and wet lab training models and animal-based X or in vivo training models. They are enrolled in a training program that guarantees the skills acquired using training models are transferred to the skill level required for safe surgical practice. But since the beginning, I felt the need to develop 
a rapid training model that would allow us to deliver a metric-based curriculum in a cost-effective way. Therefore, I started the development of human RAPN metrics with surgeons genuinely skilled at performing RAPN. And then during several meetings, Alexander Motri, Alberto Breda and James Porter did a task analysis and deconstruction of a straightforward, uncomplicated RAPN procedure, listing a set of objective, clear and complete operational definitions of phases, steps, errors and critical errors. Then, to face and content validate these human happen metrics, we organized a Delphi meeting during Eros 2021 in Dusseldorf. We enrolled a broad group of happen experts from different countries, and we reached 100% consensus on 11 phases, 66 steps, 147 errors, and 110 critical errors, establishing in this way face and content validation of our human hub metrics. Here in this, in this slide, you can see the detail through which we go in describing the different phases. And I have here one of the steps that we described, the first stitch in the renal parenchyma. So you see the description, it's very detailed. We talk about the direction of the stitch outside, inside, on the distal side of the defect. And then we say that during this step, we need to ensure hemostasis of the resection bed with an 18 centimeter running 3-0 monocryl suture. And then also we have a column for errors and these errors uh, are very detailed. And all of these phases, steps and errors are objectively identified in the videos that, you need to, uh, that we need to assess. So either the trainee or the surgeon either does or doesn't do this kind of error or this step or this phase. So it's, it's very objective, this assessment, this type of assessment. And then equipped with this set of metrics, we trained two assessors to use the metrics, guaranteeing that there was an interactive reliability above 0.8. And then we organized this construct validity study with the goal to determine if the metrics were able to distinguish between the performance of novices and experts. And in fact, the metrics were able to distinguish their performance. This was especially evident when combining the number of errors and critical errors, where we found that the experts were making 69% fewer total errors than the novices. From the moment we had those human metrics validated, we were ready to start the development of a new happen training model and use the previous metrics to develop a happen metrics for the new training model. During the development of this new training model, I took into account Professor Gallagher's simulation principles. There is no need for a training model to look like the reality, this training model only needs to emulate the reality and mainly serve as a tool for the delivery of metric-based performance feedback rather than something that approximates the look and the feel of performing the procedure in a patient. Therefore, I developed a new training model using harvested porcine kidneys that effectively emulates eight out of the 11 phases from the HAPN human metrics, crucially including the opening of the rotus fascia, renal artery dissection, and both inner and outer renography. This artificially created learning environment allows for practicing pivotal parts of the procedure. It responds accurately to physical actions made by the learner, emulating some of the real life situations and allowing the performance of errors and critical errors. At the same time, we gathered a small group of experts in the development of metrics with the goal to develop metrics for this new training model using the previously validated human hub metrics. And once again, a modified Delphi meeting was organized with the goal to obtain consensus on the adequacy of the developed metrics and reach the corresponding phase and content validation. At this moment, we are on the verge of starting the construct validation of the training model happen metrics. We will train again two assessors in the use of these happen metrics, and we will have them assess videos of experts and novices 
performing an emulated robot-assisted partial nephrectomy on the new training model. So, from the previous path, I want you to retain some messages. Never forget that trainees struggling with basic tasks will likely face greater challenges with more complex tasks. Therefore, the primary focus is to develop an unambiguously superior skill set, surgical skill set, and on proficiency based progression rather than on competency based progression, because skills impact clinical outcomes. As metrics, we should not use the subjective Likert type gears or goals, but we should use procedure specific, detailed, objective, transparent, and fair metrics that allow a consistent performance assessment. These metrics should be detailed to the point of defining the different phases, steps, errors, and critical errors. And the assessors that will use these metrics should be trained on its use and only allowed to use them when the inter-rater reliability between the two assessors is consistently achieved. On the path to build a happen training program, procedure-specific happen metrics should be built as a first stage and model-specific happen training model metrics should derive from the previously developed human metrics. These metrics should be binary, meaning that the events should be observed and objectively identified as occurring or not occurring. With these metrics, trainees will not be criticized, but they will be guided toward the proficiency benchmark. The training model should emulate reality, and the main goal in its development is not to make it look, feel, and sound like the real situation in order to enhance the educational experience. Of course, the goal is to replicate reality to a certain extent, but always going beyond simple appearances. It should enable practice of critical aspects of the procedure, replicate real life responses to a learner's actions, including for errors. It should recreate procedural sequences and use the same devices as in genuine scenarios, enhancing trainees' skill set and comprehension. The use of a happen training model equipped with procedure-specific metrics will hold the ability to deliver a reliable, valid, formative, summative, and binary metric-based assessment of happen performance. By proceeding this way, we will forge an efficient learning environment, especially because we will be in possession of a tool that effectively and efficiently delivers a training curriculum and not only and simply allows an educational experience. In a happen training program that incorporates these principles, the trainee will embark in a deliberate practice pathway instead of repetitive practice. He will receive feedback and feed forward information on his happen performance with the goal to optimally acquire surgical skills. And in the end of his training pathway, he will consistently reach the predefined proficiency benchmark and only then he will be allowed to proceed to the human patient. Therefore, one of the possible answers to the question, is there an optimal choice in the context of the current management of small renal masses, making the optimal choice often relies on procedural expertise and skill levels, which are significantly impacted by the training methods employed. This brings into focus the value of the new HAPN training model, which should deliver procedure-specific HAPN metrics that will provide formative and summative feedback on phases steps, errors, and critical errors. Engaging with this potent training ecosystem will have a profound impact on the handling of small handle masses, empowering surgeons to confidently champion the decision-making process. Thank you so much for your attention. Great presentation. Thank you, Rui. Thank you. Thank you. The question always remains that uh, will you go from the training model, the proficiency-based progression, and then to the patient, or do you still need to have the the pig or the sheep? Uh, uh, well, that's with an implanted tumor before you can go to the patient. 
uh, that's something that we we uh, we will study for sure because in well in Norsi we are planning to to have the trainees train being trained in this training model with our with the metrics and then probably in the study we will have them do a partial nephrectomy in the porcine model in the live porcine model and then we'll see the results but then the main goal is to have the trainee going from the from the training model to the porcine model to the live porcine model and then to the patient i think that will be the best Good. training pattern okay we maybe discuss later i think it was an excellent presentation and i also look forward to have this uh, being incorporated in the book that we will prepare later Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Juan Gomez Rivas is not in his car, he's in the hospital again, I think. So Juan is uh, from Madrid, he's in the Computense University of Madrid, where I visited him a couple of months ago. Uh, he's in the EAU, one of the uh, upcoming icons, I must say. He's the president of the Young Academic Urologist, he's a board member of the Young Urology Office. He is a board member of the EAU, where I'm sitting as representative for the patient office. Uh, he's working with the school. He's the director of Continuing Education Office of the Spanish Association de Urologia. And I'm very happy that he's going to speak about the topic that is upcoming in many, many uh, uh, instances and occasions. It's AI, artificial intelligence in urology. And I think it's uh, worth to listen to you. Thank you very much, Juan, for joining. And please go on. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. OK. Wait a second. Well, thank you very much for this kind invitation for this webinar. My, my lecture will be something like think out of the box. It's uh, not directly uh, to the topic of a small renal masses, but all the concepts that I will that I will tell now will be and can be applicable, of course, to the to the renal cerebral calcinoma. Uh, this is what we thought about uh, artificial intelligence many, many years ago. These are the concepts that we were, we were seeing in the 90s. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a movie that you all know that is Terminator 2, Judgment Day. This was 30 years ago. This is what we thought about uh, artificial intelligence. But, but what we have nowadays and what we have at everybody's uh, hand, let's say it's ChatGPT. ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence uh, software that is available for everyone. And this is the closest thing that many people has uh, on artificial intelligence. So by the time is, is very futuristic, but, but the future is coming. And uh, I think we should be in there, especially those that are involved in training. So what is artificial intelligence? It's the capacity given by humans to machines to memorize and learn from experience, to think and create, to speak, to judge and make decisions. So it's given to the machines those properties that are for humans, let's say. And there are many concepts that many times are uh, misunderstood or are confused. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, these are completely different concepts, but the similarity to, the similarity to them is that they, they are all implied to machines. So artificial intelligence, I said before, is giving the machines uh, uh, capabilities that are human. Machine learning is where the machine is able to learn by themselves. The machine has an algorithm inside do some task, and thanks to the errors that the machine do while performing the task, is able to correct uh, itself and get better in the task. And deep learning is a neural connection between the machines and many, many machines learning from them, uh, from each other, without any involvement of the human. So these are different contexts. So a machine can learn of course, supervised by a human and can learn alone, as I said before, and it can learn together with other machines. And this is a neat, very interesting topic that is rising in the last years. As you can see here in this slide, 
from 2010 until 2016. And of course, in the more recent years, all the publication related to artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, neural and evolutionary computing are on the rise. The current applications of artificial intelligence in the royalty field are mainly in oncology and inside oncology, you can see in kidney, bladder, prostate, and testicle in the different setups of the disease, from the prognosis uh, to the diagnosis, surgery, predicting outcomes after the surgery, and functional outcomes. In kidney, the most uh, experience that is, is on AI and artificial intelligence is regarding the surgical field and especially in the training setting. These are the three things that can be, can be um, let's say, used or the, the, the best uh, setup that you can use artificial intelligence in urology, in the diagnosis, in the prognosis, and of course, what is more interesting for this webinar is on surgical education and AI-assisted surgery. I will go very quickly through the diagnosis and prognosis and, le and later base uh, the, the, the largest part of my presentation into the surgical field. For diagnosis, we have radiomics, pathomics, genomics, and computer vision. This is an example on how can you use artificial intelligence in order to predict what will be the tumor phenotype before performing the surgery. The, the, the way that you use artificial intelligence, taking uh, imaging to predict the outcomes of the surgery in both these five features that you see here. The imaging take, of course, a CT scan, let's say, this is an example. This is not related to kidney, but this is a, a example of a, of, a, of a lung mass. After you take the image, this is a CT scan, you have to do a segmentation of what part of the image you want to take in order to extract the features to compare to other CT scans that the machine has and try to build a prediction model taking this image together with clinical data, genomic expression, and then of course come up with a, a predictive outcome that usually it's a, 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 a needs an internal and external validation. This is a test. I, I showed you some picture of a, of a lung, but this is test also in urology. This is the role of pathomics on radiomics in prostate cancer radiotherapy, for example. And here you can see where they take image from the, the segmentation is, is defining the, the, the parts of the prostate, in, in this case, that you want to, to, to be analyzed, then take this image, extract them, compare them to the specific data from the patients, and of course, build predictive models. And if you are able to predict before doing any treatment, what would be the outcome of this patient, probably it will help you a lot in the follow-up, in the treatment selection, and so on. So this is very, very interesting to be applied in all the uh, oncological or oncological field that we are managing. In, in regarding prostate cancer, this is very useful for, for predict, for example, the Gleason score. And as you can see here, all the models that has been published and has been built since 2015 until 2020, the area under the curve is very, very good. It's almost over 0 0.8, 0 0.9 in almost all the models. So we are talking about here a very, very good prediction, uh, prediction tool that we will be able to have in the future. If we add to the imaging, the, the, the pathological uh, outcomes, it's get, of course, much, much better. And this is very helpful for the pathologic, uh, for the pathologic specialists to define or to select what is a benign disease, a malignant disease, with a hundred percent of sensitivity. And of course, if you have the imaging, if you have the pathological specimen, and you can add the the, the genomic, uh, the, the the genomic information from the tumor after you do the surgery the prediction model regarding the outcomes of oncological uh, oncological progression or death 
becomes much, much better. And here you can see that it has been tested in prostate, in bladder, and in renal cell with a high, over 95% of samples predictive accurately. So this is a, a very interesting tool for the future. Regarding prognosis, we, we are able to use artificial intelligence to predict what will be the treatment outcomes and clinical outcomes from some tumors. This is an example on bladder cancer where using artificial intelligence in order to compare different uh, CT scans and predict what would be the outcome for, for metastatic disease and which will be responding to chemo or which one will be responding to immunotherapy, it's very useful with a 95% of sensitivity, 80% of specificity, 90% of positive predictive value, and the accuracy of the model is over 90% under the curve. So it's very good to identify those patients that will go well or not with the chemo or with the immunotherapy. This is very useful in order to select which is the best treatment for these patients. And in prostate is also very good predicting the clinical outcomes after surgery, specifically the biochemical response. Now going to surgical education that I think is the, is, is the, the, the most interesting topic for this webinar. We did, in the, when I was chairman of the ESRU some years ago, we did a survey in Europe, uh, specifically to senior residents and to first year consultants in EUREP. For those who doesn't know what is EUREP, EUREP is the is the educational course led by the European Association of Urology for senior residents. It's held in Prague all years. So we took the EUDA participants and we asked them about many things regarding training, satisfaction, etc. And we found that satisfaction with surgical training was very low. But the satisfaction and the confidence that the resident had by the time they finished the residency were associated with higher personal caseload with surgical training and having training resources. So I think we need to forget about what is the actual pathway of training that is usually having a mentor. The same way as Miyagi-san thought uh, Daniel-san on how to do different kinds of movements and then apply those movements in a real fight. This is, let's say, a, a, a antique way of, of training. The new way of training, already my, my colleague Rui Farinha has, has said, is has to be some uh, proficiency based and uh, taking a step by step, uh, step by step training. And this is not new. This is something that is done, for example, for pilots. For those who doesn't know this guy here, this is Captain Sully. Probably you will know him better uh, doing the interpretation by, by Tom Hanks in, in the movie. You know that Captain Sully was able to land a plane in the Hudson River in New York in, 20, 20, in 2009. He was able to land a plane in the Hudson River. He has never done before any, any landing in the sea or in the, in the river. He was able to do this because he was trained for that in a simulation setting. So if the pilots that are, that they have in the, in their, in their hands, a lot of lives when of course taking a plane, why do the medical doctors or the surgeons cannot do a training the same way? These are all the steps that happens in the OR and and, and all the people that is inside the OR when you are performing a surgery. Here you can see that the involvement of people, there are maybe, I don't know, maybe five, seven people around doing things at the same time, uh, taking time each other for doing many tasks. So many things can happen in this place that can lead to errors during the surgery. Using artificial intelligence and analyzing all these, uh, all these persons in a different way, we can see how, do, how they perform. We can identify which error has been com committed during the, during the OR scene in order to get better and to avoid mistakes during the preparation of the surgery. Also, we can use 
artificial intelligence and combine them with metrics in order to develop and validate training models. Andrew Hong, who is in, 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 in California, he's, I think he's the guru of artificial intelligence training. And he has developed this training model for radical prostatectomy where, where he compare novice surgeon against experienced surgeons. And it's amazing where you see here in, this, in, this, um, in these figures, this is the movements of the right hand, the left hand, or the camera. And you can see the, the mobilization of the experts is much, much better. They do faster with less instrument travel distance, less aggregate instrument by the time, shorter camera movements. So they are more, more efficient where, when they are compared to the novice ones. So knowing in, in a training model how you can perform with your left hand, with your right hand, with your camera, and taking track of this using artificial intelligence, you are able to say to your trainees how to do better and how to do a better performance while they are training or performing a surgery. This is recorded by a software that you can see here, how is re being recorded the movement of your right hand, of your left hand, or the camera. And after this, it can be compared with other measures of other people that is training in order to take outcomes and see where to get better and how to improve. Of course, if you are able to improve your training, you're at, at the same time, you're able to improve your outcomes uh, and to offer a better quality of care to your patients. But this is real. Is this really translate to a better quality of life or a better outcomes if your patient seems so that yes, in this paper, you see that, sorry, I passed it very quickly, but they, comp they took uh, and built a prediction model using artificial intelligence, taking many factors of the disease, at the same time, taking factors coming from this model that I said before, the, the, the way that you use your left hand or your right hand or your camera, and their way, they were able to predict the functional outcomes after radical prostatectomy. And you can see here, if you take an, as an individual, as an individual, some uh, patient's factors or technical skills or other patient's factors, it, the, the model performs worse when you take patient factors, surgical skills, and also artificial intelligence-based training. The prediction model regarding functional outcomes on radical prostatectomy, when you take the three things, gets better uh, with an area under the curve of, eight, of 0 0.78. Of course, this, is a, a, this, can, be, this can be tested in other, other types of surgery. This is a model of uh, virtual reality uh, for TURP, um, I will. Here you can see how our our trainees are able to do an uh, a surgery in a machine before, of course, undergoing into a patient in order to avoid uh, complications that you might have. The future is this one. I think the future is uh, a combination and um, try to live together uh, the machines with the humans. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very, very far future for what we are reaching there. Uh, the same way, for example, we saw in the in in Star Wars when uh, when Luke Skywalker was born and uh, how the delivery was. Uh, taken out by, by, by a machine, right? You might think that this is fantasy, but this is already happening. Uh, we use machines for our daily work to do things that probably humans don't want to do or need or are very standardized and has a lot of automatization. We use um, uh, artificial intelligence and machines, for example, for, for assembling cars. This is a, a video of an of a, of a assembling car uh, factory building uh, a car a car a car engine 
uh, and then you take the car and you don't know that this the the, the, the motor is built by, by a machine and you trust what the machine did we also have used machines for example to explore uh, caves or to turn out the fire in uh, in Notre Dame some years ago uh, machine helped us in, in that way we can we have been using these robots also for nursing this is a robot called Tuck that this robot is able to transport medication, is able to transport uh, samples, having the coordinates where it needs to go in the hospital. Are we able to use this in surgery? In the near future, probably yes. This is a, a smart tissue autonomous robot named STAR. Here you can see how the robot, of course, with the human help, is able to do stitches by their own. Uh, in order to conclude, this is in, in, in one of the papers that we did in the, in the Young Academics. These are the four messages that I want to leave. I think with the help of artificial intelligence robots, uh, healthcare givers may spend more time with patients. Uh, having an increase in elderly population, we can use some robots for, for nursing. Uh, we will be able in the future to help to have robots to help us in, in planning surgery, in teaching, in monitoring and intervening. And probably the most controversial question will be the, 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 the ethics behind artificial intelligence and the risk of malpractice of these machines. I think as, as, um, as Winston Churchill said, many people think that this quote is from Spider-Man, but it's from Winston Churchill. Uh, artificial intelligence has great power, but we should be able and we have to use it with great responsibility. So we need to live and learn from the past. The past is, is this uh, mentor trainee model. Now the present is what Dr. Farina said us, uh, a proficiency based model. And then the future is using artificial intelligence and the machines to help us and build a better world and build a better care for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Excellent presentation that should initiate further work, working together, uh, you, the young academic urologists, and ORC and artificial intelligence and training models. I think there's really a pathway that we should further explore. Uh, we will come to discussions later, but I want to uh, end uh, the presentations with inviting uh, Imran Omar, who is my uh, good friend. He's working with the EAU guidelines for so many, many years. Under the guidance, I could say, of James Sandow, who is now the Adjunct Secretary General for Education, uh, which I was before him. Uh, he has been working in Aberdeen, and immediately you understand that he's in one of the uh, groups of the Cochrane, I think in on urinary incontinence. Uh, Aberdeen University is obviously uh, Scottish in the UK, in the UK anyhow. Uh, his research interest includes systematic reviews, evidence-based medicine, and I'm not sure what is going to bring us today on evidence-based medicine when it comes to uh, small renal masses and their treatment, but uh, I look very much forward to listening to you. Imran, please uh, share your screen and go ahead. Thanks, Hein. Thanks for your kind introduction. I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? No, not yet, not yet. Yep, I think that's it. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Great. So I will try to summarize the evidence-based medicine in this short talk and will uh, highlight some of the key aspect of evidence-based medicine. So starting with the brief history of evidence-based medicine. So if we are talking about evidence-based medicine, the first name we have to take is Sir Archibald Cochrane or Sir Archie Cochrane. Uh, without his name, the history of evidence-based medicine will be incomplete. 
Archibald Cochrane was a Scottish doctor, so not too far from where I work. Uh, during Second World War, he volunteered uh, uh, in the army, but was captive and was a prisoner of war. During his time uh, with his fellow prisoner, he did his first clinical trial. And during the trial, he observed that his experience in the camp led him to believe that much of the medicine in the clinical world did not have sufficient evidence to justify the use. He also wrote a book about it in 1979 called Effect Effectiveness and Efficacy and Random Reflection on Health Services. Uh, he wrote one of the quote that it is surely a great criticism to our profession that we have not organized critical summary by speciality or subspeciality adapted periodically of all relevant randomized controlled trial. So you can see that Archie Cochrane, he was a very uh, important advocate of randomized controlled trial and his work led to uh, systematic review and eventually to Cochrane collaboration. Around the same time uh, in Canada, McMaster's Canada, Dr. David Circuit, Dr. David Circuit and Sir Archibald Cochrane, they both are considered the pioneer or the father of evidence-based medicine. So in 1981, they wrote a series of articles on critical appraisal of medical literature. One of the mentees of Sir David Sackett, uh, Dr. Gordon Guyard, he is also from McMaster's Canada. He introduced a new concept called scientific medicine. At that time in 1980s, it was a, uh, in uh, 1990, it was a novel idea to teach medicine or bedside teaching of medicine. But most of his fellows, they didn't adopt that idea at that time. In 1991, uh, Dr. Gordon Guyatt, he was the first person to use the term evidence-based medicine, which we now know. So it took us almost like a 50 years journey to reach where we are at this stage. In 1993, the first Cochrane group was built by Sir Ian Chalmers from the UK, Tom Chalmers again from UK and Mary Enkin. I think Mary was from Canada. So they built the Cochrane Collaboration in 1993. They named it after Sir Archibald Cochrane to honor his work. And Cochrane is a, a, the main ethos of the Cochrane is to provide a world of better health for all people where decisions about health and care are informed by high quality evidence. Now, what is evidence-based medicine? Evidence-based medicine is a systematic approach to medicine in which doctors and other healthcare professionals use the best available scientific evidence from clinical research to help make decisions about the care of individual patients. There are a number of questions, a number of steps we have to take when we are talking about evidence-based medicine. First of all, asking a clinical question. So suppose if we are talking about renal mass or renal cancer, we have to break it down into a question. What's the population? So the population will be patient with renal cancer. What are the interventions? So it can be robotic surgery. What's the comparator? It can be maybe open surgery or laparoscopic surgery. And what are the outcomes? So maybe overall survival. So first of all, we have to ask a question. Then we acquire all the best available evidence. So evidence which comes from randomized control trial like uh, Professor Heinwen Popel mentioned about the, uh, the, the first trial or the first randomized control trial of the renal cancer that he did or uh, Professor Sumro mentioned his current trial. So we have to mention or we have to acquire all the information. Then we summarize all this evidence together and usually we do a systematic review. If it's a high quality clinical trial, then we can only rely on the finding of a clinical trial, but sometimes or most of the time we have to summarize in terms of a systematic review. And then we apply the evidence while treating or managing patient with renal cancer. 
So these are all the various steps of evidence-based medicine, starting from a clinical question up to applying the final findings. Now, why should we do systematic review? That's the first question people they, uh, think about. First of all, it's an efficient way to assess the body of the research. Like Guan, he did mention about artificial intelligence and number of papers which are published recently. But if we are talking about trials in urology every day, and several publications are on PubMed in urology. So it's not possible for a busy urologist to read all the paper or all the publications. So it's an efficient way, it saves time. And during a systematic review process, we do a critical appraisal or interpretation of the results as well. We explore the differences between the studies and we provide a reliable basis for decision-making, which is unbiased selection of relevant information, which is used for healthcare or for making policy and for future research. Now, this is a table which compares a systematic review with traditional review. I will not go into too much detail with this slide, but because as, as this event is recorded, you can read it later on, or if you need the slide, you can contact me. Now, these are the process of doing a systematic review. We start with a question. As for the renal cancer, it will be a PICO format, as I mentioned earlier in my example. Then we write a protocol. The protocol is registered or we strongly encourage authors to register a protocol. Normally a protocol is registered on Prospero, but a Cochrane protocol is registered at the Cochrane library. Then we do a broad literature. Normally we use at least three databases for a proper systematic review. This is followed by abstract screening, full text screening, data extraction, data analysis, and then we assess the quality of evidence and final publication of the report. I will not go into too much detail in the process, but if there is interest, I will be happy to answer during the question session. Then what are the limitations of a systematic review? Results mean still be inconclusive because systematic reviews are not primary studies. They are relying on primary studies. So if the primary studies are of very low quality, then the chances are systematic review will be inconclusive. There may be no trials or evidence. So sometimes you will come across an empty Cochrane review. You will not find outside Cochrane, but usually uh, you may come across an empty Cochrane review, which means a review with no study and no one wants that, but it's still important to highlight lack of evidence or the trials or the studies that are included may be of poor quality. Sometimes an RCT may not be feasible to test an intervention. So these are all the different limitations. And finally, practice does not change because you have evidence of effect or effectiveness. Uh, even with the guidelines, people may or uh, may, uh, may follow the guidelines, but you know, like again, there is evidence that uh, people sometimes they don't follow the clinical practice guideline. At the end of the systematic review process, we apply or we assess the quality of evidence, which is also known as certainty of evidence by adopting the grade approach. I will not go into too much detail. I will quickly flip through this slide starts with a PICO question, then we rate the important outcome as critical, important or not important. Then we summarize finding. Then we summarize finding. Hold on a second, Omar. Then we we'll start recording. Okay, please continue, sorry. I'll continue. Then we summarize the finding in within the summary of findings table, and each of these outcomes, they are rated as high, moderate, low, and very low. And there are five factors that we consider. It will ex extend the talk if I'll go into all these factors, but again, if people are interested, I'll be happy to expand those during the question session. Then we write 
the, uh, the recommendation considering all these factors, including the balance of benefit and harm, consider patient values and preferences, as well as health economics. Health economics can be a difficult parameter to judge, especially for an important guideline like EAU guideline, which is used by not across the Europe, but worldwide, because there are so many different economic models or economic systems. So it's a very tricky area and it may not be always possible. Now, what are clinical practice guidelines? So I'm, I know all of you will be familiar with the EAU or the AUA guideline. There are other clinical practice guidelines. Uh, for example, within Scotland, we follow the NICE guideline as well. So clinical practice guidelines are statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care. They are informed by a systematic review of evidence and assessment of benefit and harm of alternative care option. When we are working on a clinical practice guideline, we follow a number of resources. There is a handbook by WHO. There is also a handbook by Institute of Medicine. Then Guidelines International Network, they have written a publication and they have summarized what are the key criteria of a good uh, clinical practice guideline. There are guidelines by the NICE as well as by SIGN. So NICE from England and SIGN from Scotland, they have written their own handbook. All these books, they are quite good, very detailed, and they help us to lay the foundation of a strong, valid, um, uh, and guidelines such as EAU. Now, first of all, how can clinical practice guidelines be trustworthy? They should be derived from up-to-date systematic review of the evidence base. They should be transparent. All the panel members who are included, they should reveal their conflict of interest. They are developed by the multidisciplinary team of clinical expert, methodologists, and patient rep and explicit about the quality of evidence and strength of recommendation. And these are revised periodically. For example, EAU guidelines are published every year. We do a scoping search and revision wherever it's needed are made in the recommendation based upon the up-to-date literature. Now, I will not go into the detail of this checklist. This is a common checklist that we use, developed by Guidelines International Network, and we follow this checklist uh, while preparing or developing. Stopped again, so I'll take a pause. I don't know how this happens, but... Yeah. Okay. So... The checklist that we use is developed by the Guidelines International Network. Then the other thing is people may ask why I should use a particular guideline over another because, you know, like there can be several guidelines and sometimes, you know, country-specific guideline. So one is obviously the reputation of the guideline, but other three factors that we consider is the quality assessment of the guideline. And we normally use a checklist called Agree to Assessment Checklist. Uh, we recently uh, published uh, uh, or assessed the quality of all the uh, thromboprophylactic guidelines and um, uh, publish a paper in World Journal of Urology. We are currently doing the quality assessment of all the prostate cancer guidelines. People, they do this type of exercise. It's a, it's, it's a research related activity and commonly done. I'll skip the checklist, but again, happy to answer any questions later on because again, the checklist is quite detailed. Now, a clinical practice guideline, why it's important? Because the recommendations, uh, why it's important to use up-to-date evidence while making clin uh, clinical recommendation, because recommendation that do not use the best current evidence risk promoting suboptimal or even harmful care. Now, what are the take-home messages? Evidence-based medicine is of increasing importance to the practice of urology, there continues to be a lack of high quality evidence to inform best practice in urology. Systematic reviews plays a critical role in appraising the evidence and identifying research gaps. The Cochrane Collaboration and its review groups provide an important source for high quality systematic review. 
evidence-based guideline apply rigorous and transparent methodology to move from evidence to recommendation from, point, from the point of care. And recent high quality trials with pragmatic design focusing on patient important outcome shows promise for the future evidence-based uh, uh, urology, for example, um, uh, suspend trial or catheter one or catheter two trial. And they are very uh, important clinical trials um, uh, which are commonly used by urologists. These are a couple of publications you may read if you want to know about evidence-based medicine or how the EAU uh, does their systematic reviews. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you, Imran. I'm going to maybe share my screen. All right. So there's a lot of questions, I think, and uh, if I may, Maybe start with the last speaker we have just had. You have heard, Imran, that I was telling about what the EAU guidelines tell us today. Uh, EAU guidelines are, as you said, are evidence-based, which is uh, great. Uh, there is other guidelines that are eminence-based, uh, like, for instance, ESMO, that is powerful because most medical oncologists will use that one. Uh, is there enough noise made about the quality of the EAU guidelines when it comes to genitourinary cancers as compared to the quality or the eminence-based quality of the ESMO guidelines? And can we do something about it? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question for me to answer because I have bias with, with my close association with the EAU guidelines office. But one thing which I want to say is, you know, and we are promoting it, is to assess the quality of all these guidelines, ESCO, ESMO, EAU, AUA guideline. Uh, that's one thing. Second is, you know, like working co in collaboration because Personally speaking, I prefer to avoid duplication of effort. And, you know, when EAU and S1 and ESCO, they are doing work, we should work in collaboration. Because, you know, like both these approach, evidence-based guideline and eminence-based guideline, they both have their advantages and disadvantages, and they both have their roles. So I think a common ground would be to work in collaboration and to uh, work together whenever and wherever possible. Well, let's then come to the small renal masses, eh? because obviously you're doing a great job by doing these systematic reviews, but then you see that there is mentioning small renal masses offer active surveillance or ablation to frail or unfit patients. And then after that, you mentioned the recommendation is weak. So where are we with the weak recommendation? Is this really helpful? Sorry, is it is it a question for me? Yes, yes, still for you. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, when the recommendations are weak, uh, sometimes people get confused that that means that uh, the guideline is not recommending it. When the recommendation is weak, that basically means you have to discuss in detail with your patient based upon their lifestyle, their personal circumstances. So you have to spend more time in reaching a decision. So yes, a weak recommendation is still very helpful. Okay, I understand. Does anyone have another question for Imran? Okay, then I would go to, if you allow me, to artificial intelligence and Juan Gomez Rivas. Uh, as I said, working with RC probably is one of the ways to make progress when it comes to small renal masses. But uh, what is, in your view, 
the possibility that AI will have in as an application in small renal masses is it going to do, for instance, uh, be helpful in designing robots that can do ablation therapy? Is artificial intelligence uh, going to enable machines to do partial nephrectomies? Where do you think for the next future that AI will play a role uh, in, let's say, the treatment? That's one. And second, where will AI possibly play a role uh, when it comes to small renal masses and active surveillance? It's a very interesting question. I think uh, by the time today, uh, the place that AI has, specifically in the in the renal in the renal cancer or in the small renal masses, is is in the diagnosis and in the prognosis. Uh, in the diagnosis, you see an artificial intelligence and taking many features of the scans of the patient of genomics, if you do a biopsy, uh, taking genomics of the tumor, you are able to predict with a very good predict the outcomes of the patient, if the patient undergoes or not a surgery, let's say. So it's a very useful tool in order to select which treatment is the best for which patient. So by the time, as I said, for the small wheel of masses, in, in, the, in the diagnosis and in the prognosis, in order to take this as a tool to select which patient can undergo surveillance, which patient can undergo an active treatment, it's very useful. It's not, for ev it's not in the hand of everyone. That's also something that is very true. But is there where is artificial intelligence is nowadays? Now, in the future, are we going to be able to have robots to perform uh, surgery by themselves, I have no doubt that that will come. But when? In 100 years, in 200 years, I don't know. We are not there, not even close. What we are close is this robot that I have presented that is able to do a stitches by, by, by its own. But a robot to perform a, a, a complete surgery by its own, we are very, very, very far away from there. So us as surgeons can be safe and can be can be sure that we are not going to be uh, stolen our our jobs by the time. Okay. Okay. So if someone has a question, just raise your hand or start speaking, or you will be allowed to speak if you have questions to Juan Gomez Rivas. Yes, please, name. Yes, so first of all, I was very impressed with one uh, presentation. We are doing a lots of work on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and data architecture in the UK. I mean, one referred to uh, articles by Hong et al. Uh, from uh, SCC. Uh, um, we, there's, there's a very big trial which I've just completed in, in UK, which called Mastery Trial, which is capturing automated performance metric data over 600 patients across six surgical specialities, not only urology, but six surgical specialities. And we are actually now in the process of the data has been cleaned by Intuitive Surgical. We have got the data back in the UK and we are looking at what outcomes can we measure, not in one procedure, not in one speciality, but across six surgical specialties. We look at cross speciality area. In terms of application of AI, I think we have to understand that AI actually uh, in classical terms, is the data which Imran uh, has, or data in, in basic industry has, can we apply those uh, tools to make predictions or even make, make syn synthetic data? But in surgery, there are more interesting parts when we talk about robotics and find you ask what will the robot do in future. Currently, surgical robots are, there are, there are five levels of uh, autonomy. We are at level zero. It's like a car. We have to turn the car on and then the car will go. I think in five to 10 years time, they may move to level two, probably one to two. That means that it will give us advice what to do, what not to do, uh, help us uh, not make mistakes. Level five autonomy is that it will become completely autonomous. That may take 15, 20, maybe 30 years, but we are following uh, autonomic 
uh, cars, and I think we are far behind over there. For robot to become autonomic, it has to have three capabilities. It has to have, first of all, perception. It knows where it is as compared to its surrounding. It needs to have cognition and understanding of what's happening around it. And thirdly, is uh, navigation, locomotion that it can do on its own by all of those things. There's lots of work going on. The first aspect of uh, cog cognition that robots can understand using AI models where it is. And the third part, I think, is going to be, be ambient uh, uh, autonomy, uh, uh, AI. For example, uh, we have Alexa, we have got uh, uh, all these models which actually listen to us and they talk to us as well. In future, we will have uh, all these um, materials, uh, biosensors on our body, which will give the data back. The future work that we are working on is developing digital twins. That's a concept that NASA uses when it sends rovers to Mars and everything. We are applying that to health and cybersecurity over here. So we develop synthetic digital pathways of all surgical patients. So we have a million and one pathways, we, starting from genomics data, as, as one was saying, starting from their primary care data, healthcare data, their environmental data. We can make predictions before the patient comes to hospital. While they're in hospital, we capture data from the robots, data from uh, electronic health records and make predictions about what might happen to them in complications before they go back to home and then use sensors to make sure that we mitigate those risks. And these are called digital twins. We are very at a very early stage. I think we'll have to multi-model uh, sensor input and machine input to create that whole pathway. That may be 50 years down the line, but that is where it is going in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for this important comments. If you allow me, I would now go back to Rui Farina. Uh, first of all, I need to correct you, if I may, uh, because Vesalius, he was Belgian, but he yes. was not from Brussels. He was from no. Nova. Yeah. So next time you will need to have the town hall of Leuven instead of the one of Brussels. <laughs> Again, I come back to the training models and the uh, proficiency-based progression that you have been working on and we've been working on with Tony Gallagher. Uh, there is the ex vivo porcine mm -hmm. Then yeah. there is the, uh, the training model that you have developed and then after you have done these different steps and these different etc quite complex and well elaborated and then mm -hmm. from there you add an arrow to patients again yes. I asked what i suggested earlier is in the proficiency based progression and before you do your first patient isn't there always either a cadaver surgery or a, an animal living animal surgery where you have blood vessels that bleed and that can make, bring you into trouble is this not automatically included or how do you see this really prepare someone at or see to the next day operate on this first patient well for now uh, it's difficult to have an answer of uh, which one is the best pathway so jumping from an ex vivo model to the patient we, I'm, I'm not really sure if that's the, the way to go because I don't have data on that still. Probably in a, in a few months I we will have that data because we will do the studies. But for now I would say that if we go from the model, from an ex vivo model to an in vivo model, and then we can go to the patient, I think we will be able to, to build a good pathway, a good training pathway with good outcomes. Um, I'm not really sure if the cadaver it's uh, it's uh, it's useful because the the kidney in the cadaver it's also not great for uh, for training especially when we compare it with the next vivo per sign model or uh, if we compare it with the in vivo per sign model but uh, of course with the cadaver we always have the the human uh, anatomical references but well but uh, i i don't i'm not really sure for now i don't have data intuitively I would say that we need to go from ex vivo to in vivo and then to the human, but uh, we'll see. We'll see the results. Exactly. This is this is what I actually had in mind. Uh, and you have these uh, 
these pigs and these cadavers, you have them available at an institute like Orsi. Yeah, so yeah. this is absolutely we, we a great opportunity. Also, the thing is that the metrics, the metrics that we have are very detailed and yeah. If we want to train the trainees properly and uh, give them good feedback, then we make sure that they are properly trained. And that will be also uh, very important for the training, even for to include the artificial intelligence models inside this kind of metrics. It's, it, I think it, it will be the future. But it's certainly f far more elaborated than the way we have been trained in open surgery so many years ago. Yeah. We're actually my supervisor let me do the first step of a radical prostatectomy, which was opening up and exposing the lymph nodes, and at the second time do the lymphadenectomy, then at the third time go for the dorsal vein complex, so the multiple steps, and I think the elaboration of these uh, uh, robotic surgery and uh, minimal invasive surgery is uh, great and certainly must uh, improve the quality of the people that are trained there. I also believe Does so. Does someone have a question for Orsi or for Rui? Okay. Thank you so Let's much. go to Sudir. Sudir, uh, you are talking about the, the biopsies. Huh? Yes. Do you think that one day we will have the possibility after the biopsy to tell that a fit patient with a malignant a malignancy, not a low grade, could have ablative therapies as the first choice. <laughs> That's a good question, sir. No. First of all, we know that uh, ablative therapy has their limitation of treating RCC as of now. Uh, so for this, definitely one part that uh, biopsy will tell that it is low grade. Definitely in future we can know. But uh, for that ablative therapy has to evolve further. Because as of now, we know that there is a recurrence after ablative therapy. I remember way back in early 2000 when an article came in urology gold journal it was used to be siu journal at that time and that uh, uh, editorial or maybe review some thing that yeah from the let, uh, editorial part was that the surgery for a small renal masses go went and gone but the later the data showed that there's a residual tumor and these patients may fail and that is why then uh, ablative therapy took the back hand and the partial effect mean nephron space surgery came yeah. so there are two part of this thing one is that uh, yes biopsy will be able to tell that these are low grade and we can probably put them on either active surveillance or whether patient is fit for ablative therapy who's actually is a normal patient without comorbidity yeah. for that abl th ablative therapy has to evolve okay any remarks from someone else? When I was thinking and discussing with Alessandro Volpe a couple of years ago on biopsies, because I was not very enthusiastic about biopsies in kidneys, because I saw the complications of it when I planned partial nephrectomy, that there was a hematoma, making the approach to the kidney and to the tumor more difficult. But anyway, I have been convinced that there is certainly indications to do that. But then one of my concerns was always uh, you got a result of uh, a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, uh, but maybe it's an oncocytoma. Uh, and the way around for us was that my radiologist then told, uh, for me, this is a surgical tumor, you have to remove it. Because if you biopsy it and you get the result that it's an oncocytoma, you're not going to leave it behind, do you? Yeah. It's maybe a chromophobe. Uh, so is this still an issue? This uh, uh, mim The one mimicking the other, the one being benign, the other being malignant? Uh, can you just uh, clarify uh, what is exact question here? whether a biopsy can differentiate with 
the accuracy that you, you have mentioned that is very high for biopsies between benign and malign. Can you differentiate between an oncocytoma and a chromophobic uh, renal no. cell crush? Yeah, but that, that's actually was limitation. That, that chromophobe, you may not be able to differentiate as of now. And the same is for uh, oncocytoma also. But uh, so that is why you have to go for surgery or, you know, whatever the treatment is fit for patient. But you can definitely okay. differentiate between clear cell and peplic and other variety. Then there is one last question, if I may, Sudhir. That's the, the fat arm angiomyolipoma. Yes, sir. That may be confusing on imaging where you would do a biopsy. You are not fearing to have hemorrhagic complications with your biopsy this time? Angiomyolipoma, personally, I will not do biopsy. I'll remove them. Yes. Uh, if, if they are merit the treatment, I'll remove them rather than doing biopsy because I, I, they will have bleed otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You don't see. That's that's a very clear answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Hi, Irene. You're back. We're gonna continue to go back in, in history and I will arrive with uh, Mr. Sumro. Uh, the question I still have, and I have alluded to it in my presentation, is do we not do too many partial nephrectomies? Because we like it. Partial nephrectomy is more fun for the surgeon than a radical nephrectomy. Uh, are we not... I hope that your trial will be able to show that. Uh, I have been... Uh, writing two papers to say that we probably are doing too difficult or too risky partial nephrectomies uh, in patients that could easily undergo a radical. What do you think beforehand, or is that one of the reasons why you designed partial to exactly know that? Yes, to answer your question directly, that is why we have designed uh, this trial. So I, I think there are two, uh, and to your wider question, do we do too many partial nephrectomies? Um, and there are two sides to it. For small tumors, probably we do too much heart infect maybe because if the tumors are less than four centimeter, going towards three or less than three centimeter, uh, the chance, as Sudhir was suggesting, was of having non malignant tumors is very high. So we don't do biopsies enough to be able to do that. And secondly, we don't use ablative techniques in that area sufficiently or, or rather we do not have a strong evidence to show they are equally effective and they could be used and uh, and uh, it was mentioned uh, by you as well kind over there so that is one area i think we, we need to have more evidence so once we go to t1b uh because we, technologically because two the person of and robotically we are able to do so more than we were maybe 20 years ago. Open partial vaccines in the UK is completely gone. We don't do any open partial vaccines anymore. The question uh, from uh, from you is, is it not better that these patients can have radical vaccines? And that's the question we are trying to answer. So what's the gain? Is the gain of 10 mils of GFR over a lifetime worth having an additional risk of complication of partial infection. And we do not have an answer to that question. Yeah. Now, probably, uh, it was that we get about 8%, 10% complication in partial infection. Is it the same level, or do we have maybe 4 or 5% partial infection? And what is the benefit? And what are the other compounding factors like patients with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, which is more common in patients with renal cancer? Is those things much more accelerated? We don't know the answer to that. So in that way, I think that is where we want to pitch in. Big biggish kidney tumors, but there is worth doing one or the other. So we are not at the lower end, and we are not looking at less than three centimeters tumors. Okay. I had I had one other question, uh, name uh, in in this in the setting. You tell that your participants need to have a certain degree of expertise. Uh, 
When I did my EORTC trial, this was not required. So you understand that you have a mixture of high volume surgeons, very expert, and novices, low, low experience surgeons with low volumes. Uh, don't you think that by running a, a partial, your trial, with just experts, might give to less experienced surgeons afterwards a wrong message, because exactly you have been selecting uh, experts to run the trial and not the low volume ones. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think this is something which uh, has um, impressed me uh, for quite some time, the last 20 years, as laparoscopy came in and as the body scan and the student trying to compare the new technology with the old technique the surgeons are quite comfortable on. And many a time in the RCTs, we have failed to show any evidence of benefit, technological benefit, but historically, it didn't matter. Still, the technology evolved and people stopped doing the old techniques. The question was, are we, were we asking the right question or were we using the right tool to answer the question? If our question was right, why did people stop do, not stop doing laparoscopy or not stop doing uh, robotic uh, uh, surgery? Because there's no evidence for that. There is no RCT to prove that. And my thoughts are, and we have looked at lots of uh, robotic trials that the cold, there was a roller trial in rectal cancer surgery, uh, there's IROC trial, there's other trials as well, in other specialities as well. And one of the criticism came in recurrently was that you were comparing a surgeon who has done 1,000 open or laparoscopic lateral resection with somebody who's only done five or 10 cases. You are not comparing equal with equal. The other problem with uh, surgical trials, unlike medical trial, when you give somebody five milligram tablets, that is five milligram tablets or 10 milligram tablets. And you're comparing something which is constant. In surgery, when you have surgeons on one side very competent and on the other side they are trainers, then the outcomes would not be correct. It has not been historically correct. And that's why actually, and there was an IROC trial, which is for uh, robotic cystectomy as well, which has been published last year, had the same criteria of 30 cases. And that's what we have said that what is the level of, um, learning curve you reach for you to be able to do that. Now, when we would actually uh, able to produce a report, we will mention exactly the reason why we did that, because we wanted to compare equal with equal. We didn't want to compare trainee surgeons with somebody and come back, actually the body partial back is bad or good, whatever. That's the reason behind that. All right. Thank you. Maybe I can go to the the, the lecture of uh, Paolo Gontero to finish the discussion. Uh, Paolo, uh, the toxic fat is something that intrigues me a lot, and I have been facing the problems you can run into it. Uh, would that be one of the factors, if you know it beforehand by your imaging, to choose for an ablative therapy, a percutaneous, rather than for an, an, a surgical approach? Well, certainly it would be something that uh, you have to take into account. Uh, I would not consider the sole factor, but uh, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, part of the experience of the surgeon that uh, an easy partial with a small tumor, exophytic tumor, can uh, potentially become a nightmare if you incur in a very bad toxic fat. So I, I would strongly consider that factor, particularly for patients who are elderly and uh, where we, we are not certain what we are going to gain to this patient. So not only ablative, but also towards uh, active surveillance. Uh, is it is it uh, a bridge too far when I would say that uh, if you have all techniques available, robot performs better than pure laparoscopic, there's fewer complications than with open, and the least complications you have with ablation, but just a high recurrence rate. So yes, if that I is correct, 
then should you refer your patients as a GP always to a, a center where the robot is available? Yes, that was my conclusive message that uh, some cases uh, uh, need to be handled in centers uh, where everything is available. I mean, if you don't have uh, an interventional uh, radiologist, uh, well, I wonder whether you, you should be doing uh, complex uh, partial nephrectomies or even doing partial nephrectomies. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah. At least in my country, there are centers where there is no interventional radiologist available. And then uh, you are not able to handle properly uh, complications. So what's the point to handle properly the surgery if you cannot handle proper? You, you, you yeah. miss the, the, the tools to handle the complication. Yeah. So this means you should also have a, an interventional radiologist available who, is, uh, who can do super selective embolizations, etc. I think that has yeah. been one of the statements I made before. It, it goes back to what the European Commission actually wants, is to concentrate all surgical cancer care in cancer centers of excellence. I have another question, Polo. You talked about early on clamping, and early on clamping obviously comes from the fact that in minimal invasive surgery, sometimes it's not going that fast as in open surgery. Uh, my experience is with uh, unclamping, and then having to reclamp, which is very bad. Do yes. you agree that you should at all price avoid to do unclamping, reperfusion of the kidney, and reclamping? I think this is for kidney function very bad. Yes, I I agree. I think uh, yeah. I mean, I would consider this just as a desperate maneuver. Yeah, I would not recommend this uh, as a routine way to handle uh, uh, bleeding. But you know, it's like the the, the people, the surgeons that do uh, no ischemia, they learn this uh, technique and they they are very happy and uh, no. there's no discussion. They don't do ischemia. Um, I personally think that uh, a positive margin is a complication. And uh, so a surgeon has to work on uh, the technique, uh, what he thinks is the best technique to minimize all complications. And uh, I personally think that... Uh, no ischemia might uh, have a higher risk of, uh, of surgical margin, but uh, there is no proof. We don't have evidence. So I think it's just a surgeon's perspective and perception. Okay. And I fully agree also, with, the he, with the statement you made that you should not go back in post-operatively to rescue the situation because you're going to lose the kidney. But the one final thing, maybe, you've been talking about using fat to close the gap and to have uh, the possibility to close your parenchyma, your, your cortex. Uh, what is your experience with hemostatic agents to fill the defect? Uh, I personally uh, don't use it uh, them anymore. None. I've been using for a while. I did not perceive any any advantage. Uh, so I don't use, and there is no, no evidence that they do any any good. So I think probably in terms of economics, uh, they can be easily avoided. Yeah, but I've seen a, a big arter arteriovenous fistula after having used some kind of... Uh, 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 Tacosil or something inside the kidney. So I would not advise to do that anyway. Okay, is there another question for uh, Paolo Gontero? Because Irene, I think we have uh, well stick to our time schedule. It's going to be five o'clock here in Brussels now. And so I would give you the very last word, I thank all the speakers, all my colleagues, and I hope to work with them together with the, the, the book of the Minimal Invasive Surgeries. And thank you so much, Irene. The last word is for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all the speakers to give the active participation in today's webinar and insightful presentations uh, delivered.
and the knowledge is、uh, shared, the discussion that unfolds were truly remarkable, and for the highlighting the collaborative and innovative spirit with our community. And we、uh, really appreciate your time, engagement, and support,、uh, which have made this webinar resounding success. And on behalf of the organizers and the entire team of、uh, Mini Investor Surgery, I will wish you a fantastic day ahead. And we'll upload the recording of the whole webinar to our official website, and then share you the metric of the.、Um, Whole I a、uh, whole webinar and then update you the recording when we are finished the、uh, recording. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So Irene, you were happy. Yeah, I'm happy. Okay. I think it went fine, huh? Okay. Okay. See you next time. Oh no,、See? do you have any? No, I stop sharing. There's still a lot of people connected, but okay.、It、was good to see you in in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye Maybe. bye. I hope so. You never know.、Huh? Bye bye. Thanks for all for all your efforts. Bye. Goodbye.